A very good morning to you. You're welcome along to the early morning thought <laughs> Every morning this show starts with a countdown in my ear, 54321, and this morning Toby totally managed to get that wrong. So I hope your Thursday is starting off a little better than our producers who can't count backwards from five in a row. Tommy, good morning to you. How you doing? Are you all right, Pat? You okay, hon? You okay, hon? I'm not too bad. Are you okay, hon? You're just after almost chopping off your arm. Yeah, I cut myself on the chair. In the... It's been a brilliant start to Thursday morning's OTB AM. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Yeah, very much so. I'm, uh, I'm feeling pretty happy right now that I don't. I can actually count and I've got uh, two hands. Yeah, you're also feeling very smug in your carriness this morning. I'm not going to lie. Owen has had a look of glee on his face since he's been, <sighs> he's been reading through the Cork plan to win All-Ireland in the next five years in football and he is just cackling with laughter. No, I'm not. No, I, I, the only reason... The Wicked you... Witch of the West from uh, um, The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> The, on, the, on, the only reason I'm cackling is because I, for Kerry to be good, they need Cork to be good. No, they don't. You're, that's the worst. That's like, <laughs> look, he's, see, I said, will we, will we do this piece? And he's like, well, are you going to have that look on your face the entire time? That look. Uh, no, there is no look on my face. I, I'm just laughing at, uh, I'm still laughing at Tommy not being able to count, to be quite honest with you. There's no laughing whatsoever. It's a very serious matter. I that think it's Cork 2024. Fair play to Cork. They've got, a, they've got a plan. The blue wave is right behind you. It's over, it's over your shoulder there. Mm. The, well, it, that's unleashing the blue wave. I think there was a previous document to that. Yeah, this is 2011 to 2017, which, to be fair, wasn't a bad period for, uh, for Dublin. They I'm did sure. all right. I'm sure they've got a new blue wave. There was a, I think there was a previous one to that which like laid out what was going to happen in those five years where they told everybody what they were going to do. And so Cork are just doing exactly the same thing. Cork are coming out and saying, we've got this amazing playing population, we've got those cool jerseys, and uh, we're Cork. And Owen is like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're doing. <laughs> Look, he is. <laughs> he can't deny it. You actually can't deny it. Normally you'd be like, oh, that's, that's nonsense, but you just can't deny it. Uh, well, I, can't, I absolutely can deny it. There is, there is every reason why this thing turns into a huge amount of success for Cork, because they've had very recent success. They are the only other county other than Kerry, Donegal and Dublin to win in All-Ireland this decade. So of all the counties that should be putting together a plan, this is a county where it's like, yeah, this thing could actually work. Because ultimately... Uh, life isn't fair, and if you're a county who don't have the resources or who don't have the population, putting in all your best resources and the best people into the right positions isn't going to lead you to win in All-Ireland. That is just a simple fact of the matter, except if you're a county like Cork, whereas if you get your shit together, chances are you've got a very, very good chance of getting into a position to win in All-Ireland. Now, five-year plan for Cork to win a football All-Ireland I think is ridiculous, uh, and that's nothing to do with Cork, it's to do with Dublin. I think for them to get on a level par with the likes of Kerry, Mayo, Donegal, Tyrone, in five years would be a good start. And I'm not for a second saying that that's what they want to achieve here, but Tracy Kennedy has said that the aim of this is to be a contender at all age grades of inter-county football within three to five years. A contender to win the All-Ireland in three to five years I think is extremely ambitious. But if you're not ambitious with this sort of stuff, then what's the, what's the point? So, like, uh, you are saying that you're I'm... talking yourself into it there. Well, uh, to be, I haven't dismissed this thing. There, are, there is just elements of the discourse around this which I think Go are... On. Spit it out. Which, which, I, which I find t- tickling. Uh, the, the idea of corkness. Go on. What, the is idea the, of corkness. what is corkness? Uh, okay, so ju- just to be clear, I've, I've got two pages of corkness. What do you think corkness and, and, is? And all, all the stuff, <clears throat> uh, like I've got all the, the, the good stuff pointed down. There's just a little bit at the end here called corkness in, in inverted commas. So um, Tracy Kennedy says that this plan seeks to reboot that sense of corkness in our players, our clubs, and our supporters. So they're, they're front up about this. And you know what? Maybe the idea of Corkness is a positive, and, and they see it as something that can unite the whole county, which is what they really need. They need as many people drawing behind this thing because there's so much apathy attached to, to Cork football. So if it works, fair play to them. So what is the definition of Corkness then? So Kennedy says it is that air of confidence just on the right side of arrogance, an unparalleled pride, and an insatiable desire for Cork to be the best at absolutely everything. Why is there a close-up on my face while I'm saying that? <laughs> Uh, the, the desire to be the best at absolutely everything is, uh, is an element of corkness. And what's wrong with that? Um, nothing, I guess. Nothing. It is just very, very cork and very predictable. Now, uh, Brian Cuthbert has spoken about uh, corkness. By the way, uh, Brian Cuthbert being involved in writing a report is ridiculous in itself. Brian Cuthbert should still be the cork football manager. The way in which he was allowed to leave or sacked or I don't know what the situation was in aside because of um, was that not was he not too busy oh, that was Kingston Sorry. that was Kingston yeah. uh, there, was, there was a situation there was a statement released by Cuthbert which suggested to me at the time that something wasn't right there there was a disagreement or, or something in the summer of 2015 after they should have beaten Kerry and Killarney and they ultimately crashed out to Kildare getting caught on the hop after a, a replay and people thought oh Cork you know they need to be back up there and winning Munster titles 
Look at them now. Brian Cuthbert was the last person to bring them within a hair's breadth of winning a Munster title, and they should have won that day. There was a, a, a penalty given to James Dunne that day, which should not have been. Fionn Fitzgerald scored a last gasp equaliser. So anyway, he's involved in this. But he says, we've lost our corkness. And in losing that, you don't just lose your corkness for football. We are proud people and enjoy a tradition that people in other parts of the, co- in the country would love to have. So it doesn't bother anyone, whether it's cork hurling or football, camogie, ladies football or handball. It doesn't matter. It's cork. The particular need right now is football, he says. The challenge to Corkness should be a call to arms for any and every Cork person because it is the greatest strength we have. If that's taken away from us, we are the same as everybody else. And we don't want to be the same as everyone else. We are unique and Cork football should represent that uniqueness and will do so in time. It just needs this bit of life support right now. The strongest thing anybody in Cork has is being from Cork. That is the least surprising news you're going to hear all day. You think that's like, go on. You're laughing. I'm not laughing. You are. You're from Kerry. You're like you're uh, you're you're the show one. Show us all Ireland. You look like a Cheshire cat right now in comparison. Yeah, because you're grinning from ear to ear. Yeah, because I've I've seen you. Uh, you're barely suppressing the urge to laugh at that. <laughs> it is kind of funny. <laughs> it is. It's not. It's like the the whole idea of it isn't funny. It's just that it is. It's true. It's so predictably Cork. And you know what? Cork is an extremely successful county. It's it, when you talk about the whole spectrum of things, they will say, well, they're far more successful than any other county in Munster, and they could probably content per capita they've had a more successful sporting history than Dublin. And uh, maybe it is this air of confidence, this swagger that they, they possess that's been missing from football, and that's why it's been in a miserable state for the last few I think Kerry people are literally the only race in the world who can look down on Cork and laugh the way you're doing at the moment, because the rest of us are used to just being beaten by them so regularly. Well, to be fair, they will say that we don't even put in a, a hurling team against them. I'm not for one minute taking the, the higher uh, ground here against Cork. It's Are like, you not? like we, we, we pick our battles, and that is football. <laughs> we win those battles. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite uh, Cork story about being Cork is from James O'Connor, where they're in the pre-match parade in 99. And so that's the, that's the team, that's the end of the team of Dalo and uh, Loch Nan. This, this Clare team that came from nowhere, scorched the earth, won two All-Irelands, were involved in the biggest battles of their generation. And they're looking at this Cork team in 99 with five or six under 21s on them that like they've barely heard of. So they've heard of Sean O'Gahalpine because he's a bit famous. Uh, but like, who's Joe Dean? Who are the O'Connors? Who is Donald O'Cusick? And all they can hear in the parade is we're Cork from, from Cusick, just telling the, the rest of the lads, we're Cork! And then Cork went and killed them. I mean, they might be beaten by a point, I can't remember the exact score, but... Well, the way, like, you, you it was say- just that sense that we are Cork and we're going to win today, irrespective of the fact that like, they were a bunch of kids. Now, they were all Ireland winning kids, but at the same time... I, I would say, pretend Cork is religion. And pretend, uh, in this particular, when it comes to this particular God, I'm an atheist. But I can see why that fictitious thing of being Cork can have a material impact on something. It's a coping mechanism during these tough times for them. That they're like, it's okay, we're going to get through this because we're Cork. And it's fair a, play to them. It's a delusion. Complete delusion. It's <laughs> like a delusion from uh, quite often delusional people. Now, thankfully, they've managed to get uh, a bunch of people here. Like, I would say that the Cork CCC, as, they've, as Tony Lean said this morning, Cunahan Canty and Cuthbert are far from delusional people, but there are plenty of delusional people who are going to be carried away in this red wave, or red mist perhaps, uh, from this report yesterday. And come the year 2024, they'll be looking around and saying, did we get a, a little bit of ahead of ourselves to actually be all Ireland contenders? I'd love to be proved wrong. You wouldn't. You'd be delighted to be standing there going, ah, in five years. No, I think uh, they are going to be all Ireland contenders to add a little bit of balance to this. What balance? I've, like, I've been perfectly balanced. <laughs> I literally read out their quotes. You said they were delusional. Um, no, you did. <laughs> <laughs> you literally said it's a delusion, which, uh, which, which is, again, just quoting you, giving balance to your quotes. Um, so I think that uh, Cork are actually not that far away, really, when you consider about the fact that when you, to be contenders, all they have to do is to be as good as Mayo Tyrone and Galway and Kerry. Like, they could easily get that good in three seasons. I agree. I agree. So, not, not, not easily, and three season maybe not. I think by 2024 they will be at that level. And again, coming back to my original point, the idea of them being all Ireland contenders is ridiculous because Dublin are a, a rung above. But maybe Dublin have a down year. Maybe the new coach comes in whenever Jim decides to step away after the seven in a row or ten in a row, whatever it is, and decides, okay, so 2024 will be ten in a row, would it? It started and in 2015, in so yeah, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, <laughs> Yeah, no. Oh, yeah, I lost count. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a brilliant opening to the show this morning and uh, we're going to talk about Declan Rice hey, look Darren Cleary had a good idea if Corkness is the air of confidence 
just on the right side of arrogance, an unparalleled pride and our insatiable desire for Cork to be the best at absolutely everything. Please give me your suggestions for Mayo-ness, Dubliness, Galway-ness and Donegal-ness. Uh, to be fair... Dublin, uh, Dubliness gets two ends. Yeah. <laughs> get, uh, that's like a, it's a marketing thing for Guinness, is it? Um, uh, to be fair, uh, like, I guess if, if, if all of those people defined their the way of the, defining their kind of individuality, I guess you might pick the, the Cork nature. It, it is just the idea of kind of defining yourself as having different characteristics from other counties, which is so quintessentially Cork. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I, I mean, who called them the rebel county? What was that rebellion? What was that about? There was some specific details about that. Because back to the 1700s. Anyway, I'll look that up before I, I start talking about it because it's... Um, don't want to get that one wrong, you know? Don't want to unleash the, the Twitter hell that's about to be unleashed on you. Well, good thing, good thing you didn't say, like, oh, the rebel county was named after Michael Collins. And people were like, actually, he was... They were referred to as rebels because of Cork is what people might suggest. What? As in the whole term of rebel came from Cork. As in Cork were the original rebels. And then the Irish Republicanism just took the term rebels from them. As that, 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 that would be a, a statement of... Uh, they invented the word. Well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not putting words in Cork people's mouths, but uh, it might be a Cork thing to say. The other big story of the morning is that uh, Manchester City are apparently interested in Declan Rice. Pep Guardiola has identified Declan Rice as his long-term replacement for Fernandinho. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you're the agent, you're looking at this going, yeah, let's do that. I mean, he doesn't need to play for England now. But imagine being the English player at Manchester City. Imagine being the only good... Well, Raheem Sterling, obviously. Uh, and Sterling's probably going to be there for a good while unless Real Madrid decide to sign him. Okay, so we take the English talent in Manchester City at the moment, people who play regularly. Uh, there's four of them, unless I'm missing anybody, who play regularly at the moment. S three of them play for England, one of them doesn't play as much. So Stones, Walker, Sterling, I would say, are all higher profile than Fabian Delph. And the thing with Delph is that obviously he's not a starter, technically. It's, yeah. it's Mendy, but because of his injury problems over the last two years, Delph Played a lot it, of games. It, it feels like a starting player. And because he's not as much of a three lion as, as the other three uh, England players in that Manchester City uh, squad, match day squad regularly, then he doesn't, to me, have that same level of profile. Because no, like, but I know I, we, we are talking on the back of a World Cup year. Yeah, I think the argument also, though, is that Fabian Delph was not signed by Pep Guardiola, right? He wasn't part of that era of players who have come in or he wasn't even signed, I think, by the Cheeky Bagheristein era. I think he comes just before that. He was signed in 2015. When did Bagheristein arrive? I, I don't know, but it was definitely summer 2015 when he left Villa. Um, okay, so maybe, maybe it was that group. I'm not sure. But anyway, it, he doesn't seem like a quintessentially Guardiola player, whereas Declan Rice will be coming as like their big money signing yeah. from another English, English still Premier League club, not team who are like, uh, fire-selling their players to try and pay off debts. Like, that'll be a massive signing when it happens. Do you subscribe to the idea of what Mick McCarthy was saying on Goals on Sunday a few weeks ago that the 100 cap club could be a real incentive to Declan Rice? Or are we actually at the stage now where Manchester City sign him that 100 cap club for England could actually become a realistic possibility? Yeah, totally. I mean, so I, the 100 cap thing is actually an irrelevance. You, but, swing, but, you swing back and forth on this, like the importance of it. Um, like, if he signs Manchester City, he will be stinking rich. But he'll be stinking rich times two if he plays for England a hundred times as a Manchester City player, right? Yeah, like, yeah exactly. You, you have a chance of not only the, the profile of playing for England, but actual international tournament success. And captaincy. Captaincy, yeah, it, it's like on top of that as well. But you, you talk about kind of decades down the line with these big World Cup draws and stuff, and you can see Declan Rice in sepia-tinted uh, Qatar 2022 uh, montages after winning the World Cup, and he's there to do the draw and all that sort of stuff. He, like, it's, be it's to become an absolute global superstar, you probably need to play for England unless... You're Roy Keane. You're Roy Keane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Robbie Keane did all right. Robbie Keane would be as close, yeah. Uh, He's not, yeah, it's not, it's not you're, the same you're, you're talking Harry Kane, Wayne Rooney level here, if he gets to kind of a, an England captaincy level. That being said, the guy's 19. The guy has not played for England yet. No. There is a dramatic overreaction here in we're, everything I'm saying. <laughs> we're, uh, yeah, we're imagining a, a future that doesn't exist just yet. Uh, what did you say about uh, Delph? Played for Villa in 2012? What was it? You've written it down in front of me and you're pointing at the screen. On October 2012, Chiki Bagherstein joined Man City in the Premier League. Okay, so he obviously he was then. All right, that's interesting, so... You assume Pep is like, yeah, 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 take him, yeah, 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 at that stage, right? Yeah, uh, I, I, I would think so. Like, I, I don't think the Begierstein uh, kind of tenure really matters much to Pep Guardiola, or does it? 
I don't think he like looks above him and says, "Well, this guy was your signing. I, I work fairly closely with you." No, I think he sees his own era as his own era. Uh, okay, fair enough. Uh, coming up, we're going to speak about Cork's GAA plan. Uh, around about ten past nine again. Um, for those of you who missed Owen's rant earlier, you get an opportunity to uh, revisit it at eight fifty. Dotty Weir, the interview that we promised you yesterday, will play out today. Killian Sheridan is going to join us. It's our Antipode and Adventure show today. Killian Sheridan is going to join us from New Zealand at half past eight, but at a quarter past eight, we're going to Australia to speak with Sarah Rowe, the Mayo footballer who is currently in the AFL with Collingwood. And we're bringing the sports pages right now. We'll start with the uh, Red Revival, hashtag 2024. The five-year plan to revive Cork football as GAA Chiefs admit we've lost our Corkness. Um, but what, like, do you like the fact that Cork have their Corkness? Yes, of course. I like, I like it now. I hate it when they're winning. Uh, it's... Um it's the very thing that adds spice to a rivalry, isn't it? The fact that somebody brings a uniqueness to it, an edge to it, and a rubbing your face in it when they win. Yeah. That's, that creates a, I wouldn't say hatred, but yeah, no, I, I would say it creates a hatred towards Cork when they beat you, and that creates a rivalry, and rivalries are good, and rivalries keep you interested and keep you coming back and looking forward to next summer. Is that, is that your definition of Corkness? They rub your face in it? I would say there is, uh, at, 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 in their pomp, there is an arrogant swagger to them. I would say at its worst, there is an attitude of defeatism before it's actually the time to get defeatist. As in, the way they crumbled against Kerry last year when things started to go against them was... Uh, was I'm, not, I'm not sure how to describe it. I'm not sure, is, is that indicative of Corkness or is that actually the very antithesis of Corkness? It seems like the antithesis, you're saying they're flaky. Extremely, like they, they scored an early goal in that game last year in their own home ground. It was the first time they played Kerry in, in the new Parky Cueve. They scored two early goals? Two early goals. God, I feel like it, they, it, it's such a speck of irrelevance at this point that I can't even remember. I think they did. They, they, they scored two easy goals. Yeah, they did. Sorry, they, they went down the left wing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like, and then after Kerry kind of hit back, it was just kind of like, oh, well, this is us done now. And there was no sort of fight back again. And I think that was the thing that must have disappointed most Cork people was the attitude in that game. Uh, Leinster and Galway face showdown over finance. So, provincial council and this tribesmen enjoy same deal as other counties from Round Robin. Uh, senior officials from the Leinster Council and the Galway County Board are to meet later this month in an effort to sort out financial differences which have arisen over the Senior Hurling Championship. So, the whole uh, idea of uh, Galway playing in Leinster and there being an even share of money. There are nine photographs beside that. Gone for a Burton, Ruthless City hit nine and it's only the first leg. De Bruyne, Jesus, Jesus, Sinchenko, Jesus, Foden, Jesus, Walker, Mares, nine. Daniel Harris is on Monday morning saying the real magic of the cup is when a monster absolutely destroys a minion when they think that there might be some cup magic and last night proved that again like for every moment of, of happiness we get from the grotesque of capitalism and football we have to pay our debts by watching something like this by watching a minnow get absolutely destroyed by a behemoth like Manchester City and they didn't care they were so cold about it like Zinchenko uh, when he accidentally crossed the ball into the top corner, I was kind of embarrassed at first. And I was like, oh, fair play to me, he's not going to celebrate. And then a moment later, he did like a, a basketball jump shot to celebrate. And I was like, that's even worse. <laughs> to not celebrate and then decide, actually, now nah, I am going to celebrate after putting us four n up 4 0 with an accidental goal. Uh, Tipperary goalkeeper Hogan refused permission to speak about Premier. So uh, Michael Verney has the story. There was a bizarre scenario yesterday when Tip Hurling goalkeeper Brian Hogan was up for media interviews but was not permitted to speak about Tipperary by team management. So. The uh, saying, whatever you say, say nothing brigade are out early this year. Uh, Atletico loan for Morata as Blues prepare 50 million Wilson bid. So, CAD, the transfer merry go round is up and running. Miguel Delaney has that story from the uh, Independent saying that Alvaro Morata is likely to go to Atletico Madrid. The Times, Ireland edition, 9-0. Uh, That's it, simple headline. Manchester City run riot in the semi final. There's still the second leg to come. In retrospect, saying that he wasn't going to show any of the footage or analysis of Manchester City to his players by Nigel Clough for Burton Albion didn't really work out. Maybe just do a little bit of homework. I understand that, you know, famously your dad would have been like, name the team two minutes before they're due to go out and not worry about them. We'll get the ball down, we'll do our own thing. But, you know, he had uh, good players in his team. It's not like Burton Albion went out on the pitch last night and were like, oh my God, it's Gabriel Jesus and they've got the Bruyne and David Silva. What a dream team. Why didn't our manager tell us about this incredible team? I'm sure they're aware of Manchester City. Yeah, but like a little bit of, you know, he likes to do this. You might stop that. Sometimes we could squeeze a bit here. 
I'm not going to lie, a little bit of my heart broke last night seeing that result because, of course, I was a very successful Burton Albion manager myself and football manager 2012. Right. I've spoken about it extensively on the show before. I've always Got, tuned out, so uh, what, what happened? Qualified for the Champions League okay. in 2015. I've already tuned out again. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, other story here is, is uh, Ulton Delan. Good news, more good news for Connacht. So, Ulton Delan has committed until 2021. He's only 25 still. And um, Delan, when he was playing with the Ireland team, you really felt like he was about to be one of those players who burst forward and um, would make it sooner rather than later. But he's a second row. Like, there's no reason why he can't have uh, a proper coming to the full peak of his powers around the age of 28. So, like, sometimes you just need to be patient with uh, these players who make it early and don't always immediately follow that up straight away. Definitely. And it does seem that 2020-2021 is going to be a pivotal season for the players on that rung in the ladder who, barring an incredible run of form now or an incredible uh, loss of luck when it comes to the first choice, second rows in the Ireland squad, is not going to be on the plane to Japan. And therefore, is, you know, he's, he's obviously going to be playing week in, week out while Ireland are playing in Japan. He'll be uh, hitting the ground running when it comes to the pivotal European fixtures at the end of the year. Hopefully, from a Connacht perspective, they could be in the Champions Cup. And then suddenly this time next year, he could be in the shop window for uh, the Six Nations in, in 2020. So uh, I, I think it's a big season for him next year. I just you do get the sense there's not too much you can do for this year's World Cup. No, exactly. Uh, so the Racing Post, uh, Sam Crow, a big deck for festival after lung infection diagnosis. This is um, bad news for Sam Crow. who has been uh, described as a very doubtful runner for the Cheltenham Festival in March after a deep-seated lung infection was discovered in tests taken from the seven-year-old following the tame defeat in the Ryanair hurdle at Leopardstown on the 29th of December. I think there's a general consensus that um, something must have been up with Sam Crow given the uh, performance. And Jesus hits four as Burton endure a demolition job. Good picture as well. In the 90th minute, 9-0, nine 9 90. And then Spurs fear they will not play a new stadium until March. Neil Warnock is getting his way. Everybody else is going to have to play Spurs at Wembley instead of um, in their betting in period at the new White Hart Lane. It looks nice. It looks like it's going to be a nice stadium. Yeah, as in it's probably the best new stadium we've seen in the Premier League. Um, like you think about all Eddie had, Emirates, even at their time, they were fairly futuristic, but this one is kind of like a level above. It, it seems that uh, they've kind of done it right. Yeah. The, the, the way it is going to be worth it from a Tottenham perspective. The Olympic Stadium wasn't a great, is not no. a great. No, that, that, that was probably the most underwhelming new addition to the I've Premier League. I've been there for a rugby match. I've been there for a football match, but um, yeah. Interesting piece from um, Dave Hannigan about uh, Tom Brady and how he's um, defying Father Time, although not actually anymore, and Alex Guerrero just kind of lays out the full details of um, Guerrero's past as a snake oil salesman, effectively, who got, um, was claiming he was a doctor but isn't. And, Is he uh, still working with Brady? Oh, yeah. With Brady and Gronk and Edelman and... So he's actually got more in his stable now than he did 12 months ago? Uh, I think they were all part of it. Certainly Julian Edelman was part of... So Edelman and ACL last season and missed it and went to Guerrero and in the off-season uh, got popped for some unknown um, PED and missed the first four games of this season. Um, there's no link, obviously, between Guerrero and the PED and certainly nobody has established that link. Um, but Tom Brady was very tetchy about that question when he was asked, like, what happened there? Isn't he working with your guy? He's like, oh, this is bullshit, and walked off in the press conference. So when it's all laid out like that, it's like, here's the thing, American fans don't care. They don't care. They just want to see Tom Brady out there. And has he gone off the cliff? Yeah, no, no, like, he's a... He's a middle, That's not a good season. Well, no, but he's a middle-tier quarterback now, as opposed to... the So last season he was the MVP. Is there anything yeah, off? I anything off, that, you know? It? Um, the Herald this morning go with City on cloud nine as Jesus strikes for four and you've also got that Spurs to say at Wembley until March story at the back page of the Irish Daily Mail is 9-0 and it's only half time uh, while Galway lost mental battle says Treaties Flanagan that's Seamus Flanagan uh, Limerick's All-Ireland winner who was in front of the media yesterday saying that Galway uh, lost the mental battle in last year's All-Ireland final uh, the Sun then goes with 9-0 and there's still 90 minutes to go and we've also got the story here Rice won for Pep. Champions turn to Declan. We'll be speaking about that again later on in the show. Uh, the back page of the Irish Daily Star is ruthless. Four for Jesus in Burton battering. While Rashford is my main man, says Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And uh, Chelsea are not happy with Bayern Munich. Blues fury at Bayern. They're ready to report Bayern Munich to FIFA in a tap-up row over Callum Hudson. Uh, Adoy at the German Giants bidding €39 million Euro for him recently. Uh, back page of the mirror is Pep on cloud nine. And uh, Kevin Kilban quoted, Old King Cole, Seamus has to modify his game to stay at the top level. 
says the off-the-ball pundit. And uh, the back page of the Guardian, finally, is uh, 9-0. Sweet Jesus puts City on cloud nine. Brazilian striker scores four. And drawing the line in rugby, literally, uh, action on high tackles could include a mark on jerseys. This is a story by Robert Kitson, saying that English rugby's leading players and administrators want stricter penalties for high tackles and also the idea of a visible line being printed on jerseys is among the ideas being considered to try to reduce the game's worrying attrition rate. Um, we should talk a little bit about the, whether or not Rice is actually the right player for Man City. Is that like, I mean, we're obviously thinking about it, oh, this is what the impact it might have on us, but is he the right player for Man City at the moment? Is he, is he Fernandinho or is he actually a centre-back who has just to develop into a centre-back? It's interesting, isn't it? Because the discourse over the last two weeks has certainly been towards Declan Rice as a ball-playing centre-back that if you wanted him to be a successor to anybody at Manchester City, if you just put age out of the window for a moment, is actually John Stones. They have been the comparisons made over the past couple of weeks, uh, especially in the British media. I think over here we're all like he's a essential midfielder or a, a deep-lying midfielder, whatever it may be, just because from an Irish perspective we need our best players involved in a more prominent position. But certainly over there, the, the school of thought seems to be that he's a John Stones type uh, ball-playing centre-back. So does that mean that... Pep Guardiola sees him as a Fernandinho though, is it? Like, is that... We don't know. We like the, the the reports this morning are that he sees him as a successor to Fernandinho. Uh, like it, it's quite easy for Manchester City to be linked to Declan Rice for that story to get out, and then for newspapers to put two and two together and say, "Well, Fernandinho is thirty-four. He must be seen as a successor to him." Unless Pep Guardiola is looking at his backline options and thinking, "We just need to stock up with ball playing centre backs, and I can make Declan Rice." Can he play with John Stones? Is I don't that think possible? he can play with. I'm not Why sure not? he can play with him. Why not? Like, can, can but they... maybe he can. Like, we, we, we are very we're very quick to say, you know, when it comes to striking partnerships or to centre back partnerships, little you need large. a little large. You need you need chalk and cheese. Yeah, and, balls. Uh, like, what is um, Manchester City's first choice centre back partnership at the moment? It's Laporte and Stones, really. How dissimilar are they? Well, the company plays a lot. He does, he does, but I, I would... In the big games. Put a gun to Pep Guardiola's head, and he's got to pick... Say, say Benjamin Mendy is fit. He's got Mendy and Kyle Walker starting. Who does he pick at, at centre-half? And I would say it's going to be an important zone. It's only next season, choice. I would assume that would be... At the moment, I, I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a debate, right? It's not, it's not um, fully clear. But then, so Declan Rice is not going to break that partnership up next season, is he? Don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, the thing is, they've got such an absurd amount of money to spend that could Declan Rice be seen as bench fodder for Pep Guardiola, potentially? And you know what? Maybe he sees him as a little bit more than that. Maybe he sees himself reverting to you know back three and pushing Kyle Walker and Benjamin Mendy up a little bit further up the pitch. John Walters was on after the he did the commentary of the game between um, Liverpool and City with Nathan on Newstalk, and afterwards was talking about. You know where he would see him fitting in, and he made the point that he does all the work that Fernandinho does there. If I was one of the big clubs, although he's signed a new contract, he's one player I'd be looking at. The whole point of signing a new contract is so that Man City, or so that West Ham, get value for him. So they're absolutely happy to sell if the price is right. That's the whole way that West Ham have always done business. So um, maybe the thing to do is for Ireland just to wait until he moves to one of the bigger clubs who don't care what international team he plays for, because like. Uh. <laughs> Pep, Mick McCarty should pick up the phone to Pep Guardiola if he moves to Manchester City and say to him, listen, we don't qualify for tournaments much. This yeah. guy on, yes. on every even year is going to yes. come back in August. Yeah, refreshed. Fit as a fiddle. Yeah. So could you just have a word with him? Yeah, and also, like, you know, appeal to his uh, Catalan. We get him to wear a yellow ribbon. Yeah. You know. Yeah, Mick McCarty. Or Mick we're, McCarty. we're not the imperial power in this, Pep. It's, send Mick McCarthy over on a, on a one-man convoy uh, wearing a yellow ribbon. Bring, uh, you know, just be casually reading a book about Catalan independence. And, oh, hey, Pep, good, in, good to see you in the hotel lobby. Oh, yeah, no, I, I speak a bit of Catalan. Yeah, God, yeah. Just did my spare time there. Teach, teaching, uh, teaching Declan a little bit of Catalan as well. And uh, yeah. that, that education can continue if you just push him in the correct direction there, Pep. All right, a little bit later on, we're going to go to um, Wellington to speak with Killian Sheridan in New Zealand. But first, let's go to Australia, where uh, I guess the weather's a little bit better than it is here. Sarah Rowe, oh, wow, look at that weather. <laughs> Hi. You're making us very jealous. Yeah, it's about 26 degrees over here at the minute. Wow, holy moly. How's the football going? Um, so far, so good. I've only played one challenge game um, so far, so I haven't got a proper feel for it yet. I'll know more when the games start, but the training's been going well and skill development and fitness and all that. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I was, I only brought up the football straight away because I don't really want to talk about how good the weather is. But tell us a little bit about how good the weather is. You've been there a month, have you? Yeah, I've been 
I had six weeks before Christmas, went, came home for two weeks, and I'm just back a week now from Christmas. So the weather actually in Melbourne is quite up and down. So it'd be like maybe 35 degrees one day, 20 would be considered like cold. So today was like a relatively cold day, but tomorrow is uh, due to be 40 degrees. So um, it's quite up and down, but it's normally very good so it's, it's a really good lifestyle over here yeah it sounds like it's amazing so you obviously had the opportunity to do a bunch of different things you could have stayed and just concentrated on Gaelic football there was last time you were in talking to us there was um, some possibility of maybe going to the States to do soccer what was it ultimately that made you decide that you wanted to go to Australia and have the lifestyle from heaven <laughs> it's like such a stupid question <laughs> um, I suppose it was it was a new challenge for me. Um, I played soccer. Um, I had played at Mayo, and I thought that the skills were transferable um, from Gaelic football to AFL. So it just was a completely new challenge, new people, and something I just thought I'd like to experience. And also, I just thought that like I didn't have to give up my oh. in Ireland, stay in Australia. I knew it was like a short-term thing. I could come and go again. So that was that was a really appealing thing for me that I could play both AFL and G and GA at home. So if I had to give up male football at home, I don't know if I would have made the decision to move. So and um, that's what was probably the most appealing for me. Yeah. So from Collingwood's perspective, obviously they, they don't really just want you to come down for one season either. So I, I guess it makes sense for them to be allow you to be able to go back during their off season and keep your skills up and continue to play really well, and then hopefully come back for year two. Um, yeah, they have not invested in a player if they didn't want to keep them for probably longer than a year. But I suppose it'll be all down to how the matches go and um, how, if I really enjoy the lifestyle, if I want to stay, if I think that I can make a difference out here. And um, so it's kind of all subject to change, I suppose, over the next few months and um, just see how I get on. Just going to take them one day at a time so far. But um, yeah, I'll focus on this while I'm here. And then when I get home, I'll be um, stuck into the male football then as well. You say that you thought the skills are transferable and that was part of your decision to go there, Sarah. Have the skills been transferable? Have you just picked it up very easily? Um, yeah, they have been quite transferable. Obviously, we kick a lot in Gaelic football with the inside or the outside of our base sometimes. So it's like always kind of like that punt kick that they want in your body to be in a straight position. So um, that has been a bit of a change for me. And obviously the shape of the ball and catching the ball is just a bit different. But yeah, it's quite transferable. And like some of the drills that we do would be like hand passing drills that you do at home uh, playing football. But there, there is, there's, it still comes with the challenges, like the, the marking side of things, like you're, you're up against really strong, big girls. And I'm just a small player who kind of comes in and crumbs the ball. So um, there hasn't been a set role, I suppose. There's been a few roles and they want players to be able to play all over the ground. So I've played in numerous positions since I've come out here. So we're just trying to, I suppose, figure out which I'm best at. And then on a physical level, like you say, obviously there's bigger players there. Is that kind of a rule across the board that they're maybe a bit ahead in strength and conditioning or not at all, that you're, you're up to speed with them? In terms of strength and conditioning, no. Like it, Just because they're bigger doesn't mean that they, say, lift heavier or are stronger in the gym that way. But um, I suppose just their physical presence being that tall, uh, say the three inside forwards would be like three really tall girls normally and the kind of around the middle of the field as well, you'd have two or three like six foot two girls. and But that's their position and it's completely different to say a position I'd play. So there's like, there's all different kind of um, shapes and sizes and like, but just but all down to different positions. How good are Collingwood? The best. They're so good. They have been nothing but good to me so far and they've like given me everything that I could need and have been such good support and really good people involved and if I ever need anything I, I always have someone on the other line to help me. So it's been great. There's a couple of young Irish lads out of Collingwood now as well, is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. My house <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's uh, Mark Kane and Anton is Tohill is out here as well. So I see them all the time. They did great integration between the men's and women's teams out here. So we had a joint session with the men's team before Christmas. And that's just to kind of get to know uh, the people around the club. And we had the same with uh, the women's netballing team. So they tried to 
make it kind of one club, like one voice, uh, one vision. So um, I always see the boys and um, they're getting on well as far as I as far as far I know. And I watch them training a bit as well and they've been doing really well. When did so you see- the thing is as well, with like, so because not all the, all the women's coaches are full-time, they're not full-time employed. So the men's coaches would take me for like extra skill sessions on the days we have off and stuff I've that makes a lot of sense when does the actual season kick off Sarah uh, 3rd of February we play Geelong down in Geelong and it's their first game um, ever in the AFLW so it'll be a historic and um, it's on so it's on down there all right, the line's getting a little bit, uh, the wind has picked up, I think, a little bit. Um, but, uh, Sarah, thanks very much for joining us. We'll check in with you again real soon. Cheers, best of luck. Oh, yeah, line's gone. Very jealous. Yeah, it's unbelievable, isn't it? It's a good time of the year to be down there as well. It's also a fantastic opportunity, the way the season's work, to be able to dovetail beautifully between the two things, yeah. where you can come back and still do what you do. And it's, it's, it's very easy for us to sit here and say it's an easy decision for people to go to Australia when we haven't been in, uh, we, when we haven't worn the inter-county jersey, when we haven't felt that pride that comes with being a, a pretty successful county over the past uh, couple of years. Yeah, totally. To actually just leave all that. Because for me, it's like a very cold thing. It's like, why would you not go to Australia? You can make money, uh, you, you can just focus on sport, you get a different culture for a while, and you get that sort of weather. But then you actually put yourself in those shoes and it's like, are you actually going to turn your back on your county and all, and all the people uh, that might be persuading you to stay? So it's fantastic that, I don't want to say a decision hasn't had to be made because just, obviously I'm sure mayor training and all that sort of stuff at the moment. So uh, it's good to not have a huge decision like like some people have to. Tommy was saying that um, when they were setting up the um, Skype a little bit earlier on, he was getting a bit of a tour. There's a, a swimming pool behind where she was sitting. So right where where we are in the phone is where the swimming pool is. So. Looks like a nice gaff. Yeah, I, th- I think I'd last for two seconds in that country, to be honest, to just like I'd turn purple with sunburn, <laughs> never mind red. Yeah, you can just wear clothes, a burqa. Yeah, that's a very good idea, actually. I might get that one for uh, the Ireland summer this year. Uh, she wouldn't do it inside the house because there's 10 housemates inside as well, who I think are all um, teammates in Collingwood. So uh, we'll check in with Sarah again real soon. Um, and uh, yeah, keep an eye on how she's getting on down under. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk with Killian Sheridan a little bit later on about um, his career in... Wellington, I didn't realise they actually play in the AFL. So there's a lot of travel involved there. Because like everybody, oh, New Zealand, Australia, they're close. They're not really. They're quite far away. Like the big long flights, so uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of travel involved in that one. Uh, Richard, Hog- Hogan, <coughs> Richard Hogan, why is Owen laughing? They've won sport in Kerry. Won. I- How many sports people do Cork turn out every year? Smug Kerry fellas with their decent population view football and utter religion. Well, I did. I did say that literally earlier on. I didn't. I'm not. You were the one who was trying to push me to sneering against this thing. I was. <laughs> you definitely were. I mean, it just came naturally to you. Owen. No, like when I, I'm giving this all the respect it deserves, and that is like taking it very seriously. I just started laughing because you started laughing as well. <laughs> I'm not laughing at this thing, and I did literally say that it was like, well, we don't, we don't have a team in the Munster hurling championship. Furious, I, furious I said, backpedaling from. Uh, no, I'm Kerry Booster. I'm just repeating what I literally said on this program this morning. Okay, um, you've got a very uh, short-term memory loss is a, is a problem, Jerry. You need to get this checked out. The uh, the idea that they've actually produced per capita, as I said, just as many sports people as Dublin, uh, is something that I'm sure some Cork people believe, and it's not actually the most ridiculous argument ever. So never mind Kerry. Like I mean, uh, Cork probably viewed itself as one of the best sporting counties in the country, and they've got uh, they've got a right to that throne if they want to fight for it. Yeah, their um, their Mount Rushmore is pretty good. We exactly, can't, we can't exactly. on it. No footballers on it, though. No. No, he probably wouldn't stick a footballer on it. Does Dave Barry get on for being, like, a legend in two sports? Maybe he does. Like, there's... there's you, you could make a, a GEA a Mount Rushmore for a cork and it would, you'd struggle to get a footballer on it, unfortunately, uh, just because of the greatness of the hurlers. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a fair point. Um, Sarah Rowe was chatting to us as part of our 20 by 20 coverage. Check out at 20 by 20 underscore dot IE on Twitter for more to keep up with uh, that campaign to um, to boost the number of uh, people attending matches uh, for women's sport, people watching women's sport, people talking about women's sport, and the people participating in women's sport by 20% by the year 2020. Now, the new Ryder Cup captain, Park Harrington, was on the radio on News Talk and Off the Ball last night, 
talking about becoming the new Ryder Cup captain. A little bit of nerves for him ahead of the media, which was uh, unusual to say the least. Here he is talking uh, last night with Joe. Have a look. It is a big thing whether you, as you, as you, if you win or lose. It will um, follow you around a little bit. You will be remembered by a generation for it. Uh, it struck me you were, you were certainly aware of that. Yeah, look, I, I, this, I'm going to be 49. I'm 47 now. I'm going to be 49 when it, when it happens. Uh, and it's, there's an element of this, oh, it's my time. You've, done, you've won your three majors. It's, it, it's payback for your career in Europe walk into the job and do the job because you're the man. Yeah. But do I really want to do it? I'm not going to do it for the sake of doing it. And I had to sit back and look at that and see, well, do I want to put this on the line? Do I feel I'm capable of managing a team just because I've had a good career hitting a little white ball, ball around the golf course? Yeah. They're two different jobs. Yeah. Uh, they really are. And, you know, I said this yesterday, this is not like Premier Premiership football. If I do a bad job, I don't get another go. Mm. It is one and done. Mm. Uh, so there is there is an element of pressure, and and if you fail, even if you're a good captain, if you fail, people will find reason for fault. If you win, and you're not a great captain, it will overlook to you. You just had a win, so it, it is very black and white. The, yeah. the Ryder Cup. Yeah, it's very binary. You win or you lose. You're a hero or a chump. You're the greatest of the goats. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I agree with that totally. Just given Bar Medina, Europe haven't won in uh, America in a long time, and it just tends to not happen. Has any losing captain come away with? Well, I think it's possible. Enhanced? I think it's but not enhanced. I, I, I think it's possible for you to go there. The American team next year, barring, I don't know, some some surge in form from an, a huge amount of Europeans will be better than the European team. They've got home course advantage and they've got better golf So they're favourites, right? Like huge, I would say huge favourites. If you're still in the match with the final two pairings in the singles up for grabs, you've done a reasonable job. Yes, and... and has, I think and I think that would be a way that you would... Has your reputation your... been enhanced in that case? As, as a human being, yes. I would say as a person who's like, that person is uh, an expert in... You know, he's come away from this having learnt a lot, and it's okay. Improved and I, I would agree with that. I said that most most sports would treat it like that. Most organisations would go, "Oh yeah, you did." You know, uh, like anybody who gets within an ass's roar of the Dublin football team, everybody goes, "That guy, that team, they did a good job." Fair enough. Apart from the most one-eyed, one-handed uh, fans, right? With golf, you've got the cattiest, bitchiest changing room of any sport in history where they all hate each other and they're all spoiled, petulant millionaires who have entourages telling them, you're the best, you're the man. Day after day after day after day after day and they have to believe that because otherwise they're going to get their, their throat slit on the course by some no-marker they hadn't heard of three weeks ago. As a result, stuff leaks out quicker and faster than it does in any other sport and no matter what type of job you do, you come away from it and everybody goes, that guy's a bit of an asshole. Like, Tom Watson might not be the greatest Ryder Cup captain of all time, but he sure as shit is one of the best golfers of all time. Mm -hmm. And his reputation is now, oh, well, that guy couldn't even manage a Ryder Cup team. As opposed to, that guy nearly won a major at, like, 60 because he was so bloody good at golf. Different things. Like, very different things. Do yeah, but, uh, but that's how, that's how you, you, become, you become your Ryder Cup captaincy. He's right, he's risking a lot, I think. Oh, uh, I, I'm not disagreeing with you on the point of captaincy and playing being completely different things. That's pretty obvious. The idea that your reputation would be in tatters after losing a Ryder Cup and that being the definition of... Uh, of what do you think, of, what do you think of Tom rule? Watson now? You don't think, oh, that guy Tom won five Watson opens. A, that was a, a special enough case, to be fair. Do you expect, really, Podrick Harrington to do anything that would... What do you think of Darren Clark now? I, I, would, I would still say when it comes to Darren Clark's reputation is still very much as a, as a major winner. And I, I wouldn't say that my, my view of Darren Clark hasn't been affected by his Ryder Cup captaincy performance. All right. Paul McGinley greatly enhanced. Yeah. Um, so I, think that there's, I think there's an opposite side Thomas to that Bjorn too. Thomas greatly can... enhanced. Podrick Harrington, like the Tom Austin situation was, I don't think Phil Mickelson was coming out and it was like sour grapes. Yeah, I think it was more to do with there was an actual <laughs> genuine problem. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not but sure. There was an element of sour grapes, probably, but I can't imagine Paul like, Harrington Nick is going Faldo, to be so... Nick Faldo's reputation took a massive kicking when he lost the Ryder Cup, even though he's yeah, a... He's just not a good Ryder Cup captain. I'm saying he could be a good Ryder Cup captain and lose. Yeah, maybe, but like, but here's the thing. Faldo was one of the best golfers... Doesn't matter. ...a, a, a, a 
continent-defining good quality golfer, and then is now also a brilliant TV analyst. And for a little period of time, there, I was like, oh, he's a bit of a wanker, isn't he? And I was like, what? That was, very, that was massively unfair just because he wasn't particularly good. Who was saying that? Who called him a wanker? Most of golf. Really? Yeah. Give me, give me names here. Give me names. Well, no. I don't, I certainly, I, if you told me Nick Fallow, you said the name Nick Fallow to me, the first adjective that comes to mind is certainly not wanker. Well, I, it was for I, the, I, I certainly think... Uh, there were loads of little catty golfers. stuff coming out about how crappy he was in the team room. Like, how he lost everybody, how, like... Uh, and maybe he did. Yeah, maybe... Uh, maybe he did. But maybe he didn't. Maybe it's just the golfers... How do you know? Because like, still, you're, you're literally arguing it, against it, me that we, we just can't have a... No, 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 no. I'm saying that there's a, there's a distinct pattern here. Anytime you lose, you're automatically a chump. Let's move on. I'm not sure. Davis Love. I'm not sure. Like, oh, that guy... I'm not sure you're automatically a chump. I think you're a chump because of things you do that lead to defeat. And Podrick Harrington could be excused for losing to a fantastic, fantastic, like all time good uh, American maybe, team. They maybe. were talking we'll about this American team maybe. coming to Paris as an all time good team. Okay, well, let's move on because um, Killian Sheridan is ready and waiting down under and uh, is holding his um, phone, so we don't want him to tire out his arm. He's a professional athlete and he needs all the energy he can get. Killian, how are you? All right, how are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. How are you? What time is it in Wellington? Uh, it's half nine p.m. Very good. How how is your body clock adjusting to life down under? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of back to normal now. It took me a while to be honest. I'd say it was about a week before I was fully sleeping right and everything, but eventually I got there. How did you end up moving to Wellington? What was that process like? Uh, it was actually it was quite quick compared to how things normally would happen. Um, the club got in got in touch with me, said they were interested. I spoke with the manager, um, and they were pretty keen for things to move fast uh, because of visas and stuff like that. Um, so those and also the holidays, New Year, Christmas, um, wasn't an ideal time to kind of move over and try and getting things done. Uh, so for them, it was kind of to get it done as quickly as possible. Um, and that was basically it. I was kind of, when I first got the call, I was a little bit oh, like in two minds about it, then spoke with the manager, and uh, he really persuaded me. Why were you in two minds about it? Uh, just the distance, really, where it is. Um, I've had a few like people asking me if I'd be interested to play in Australia before, and I just always thought it was so far away. Um, but then kind of the more I was talking to people, everyone was just saying how good of a place New Zealand especially was to, to live in. Um, and just that kind of that kind of swung it for me. Yeah, I mean, I'm, like you've had literally one of the most interesting football careers that any Irish footballer has ever had in terms of the places that you've played. So there was always clearly a willingness from you to go out and see the world really. Yeah, definitely. I don't think um, I think I get a bit too much praise just for going to places. Like it's not. It could be a lot worse. I'm going to somewhere where I have a job, everything's set up. The job's no different to if I'm doing it in the UK or if I'm doing it in Poland or Cyprus or New Zealand. Um, it could be much harder. Like I could be going, moving to a country where I'm starting from scratch. Whereas here I know everything, I know it's football, it's the same sports in all the countries. Um, so I don't know, it's never really, it's not something that's phased me. Um, and I think kind of from when I was young, going to Bulgaria, uh, it kind of set me up for for all the moves after it. Um, that made it a lot easier, I think. So Bulgaria was the first serious away move from the UK, was it? Yeah, yeah. Um, that, yeah, obviously that was the biggest one because it was the first one. I was young. Um, How did that come about? In retrospect, like what was the what was the decision making process? Was it as as swift, or did did you have two minds about that the way you did about this one? Yeah, that one had took me a bit of convincing. Um, I'd kind of I was it was an offer I got kind of at the beginning of a summer, and then when I went back for pre season with Celtic. Uh, Kind of the offer was still there, and then I just 
I went over, looked at the place, and even when I went over and was looking at it, I was still kind of not sure about it. And then just just went for it. And then it didn't go good. It didn't go to plan. Um, didn't work out good. But like I, I always said it at the time when I went there, that worst case scenario is I'm there for two, three years. I'm still going to be young and I'll have the experience of living and playing abroad. Uh, and that kind of proved to be right for me, I think. Did you, in retrospect, understand why it didn't go well, what you could have done differently, or was it just the circumstances? Because, you know, sometimes these these experiences, they don't go well, and it's always the outsides. Like, we've all made mistakes in our lives where we blame somebody else for what we did. In retrospect, maybe we would change things when we get there. You know, like, have you become a better traveller since then, I guess? Uh, Travel-wise... Yeah, I'm not sure what what I would have done differently, but football-wise, I definitely would have done things differently. Like, I wouldn't have been training good when things were going bad. I would just kind of would have sacked it off and I didn't really care. Uh, and the fact that I wasn't enjoying living there, I let that affect football, like in training and stuff. I'd bring that into my training, whereas now you kind of... Not separate the two of them, but if you let it affect your training, then you have no chance. Because then, at least if the football is going good, it gives you something to yeah to cling on to when when you're in places like that. Yeah. So from there, that didn't go to plan. You go back to Scotland for a little while, and from Scotland at that point, then it's to Cyprus. That's kind of when the the rest of the the travel starts to take off. Is it? Uh, yeah. So the Cyprus. Um, came up from Paolo Sergio got the job there and he was at Hearts in Scotland so he knew me from there and that one as soon as I had the interest I wanted to do that straight away um, that was easy for me as soon as as soon as I was speaking to him I was like yeah I want to 100% that's what I want to do um, and then going there like was lifestyle wise it's perfect you're it's laid back, it's kind of island life. Um, and then the football is a bit of a shock because it's so contrasting, like how they live their life. And then football is the complete opposite. It's like passionate or obsessed with it. Um, but yeah, for to, the initial like offer to go there, straight away I, was, I, I wanted to, to do it. Yeah, you were goal every two games in Cyprus as well. So the... You obviously played really well for those two seasons. Um, yeah, not sure about those stats, but all right, okay. Did I make them up? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're doing me a bit of credit there. <laughs> uh, we'll go, we'll go with them. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, no, it was good. Um, when I was over in Cyprus, uh, probably one of the biggest things I I met an Irish guy, Niall Stack, who's was doing bits of sports psychology and we just kind of started working together. He wanted to get kind of an insight into football and I wanted the same from him, like to get an idea on the mental side of, of the game. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the, the biggest changes I had over there. Um, and it helped me then in Poland, like when, like I said before, when if you're not enjoying living there, not letting that kind of affect your training. You're still going in and you're training properly and trying to do everything right. Yeah, Niall Stack's obviously involved with uh, Tipperary GEA, with the, with the footballers. I think he's still involved with them at the moment. He certainly has been. What did he learn from Niall? Uh, just, just kind of focusing on training every day and not letting like standards fall or... There might be times in, if training's not going so good and I'd let myself like drop down to... If the, if the standard in training wasn't good, I'd let myself drop down to it and I'd just kind of go through the motions or I'd do enough just to get through it. Um, whereas I kind of... Probably the biggest thing was just changing that. And like, if training wasn't going good or if it was a bad training, just everything I was doing, just do the best that I could, which... Obviously, people might be listening to it and thinking, well, that's how every footballer should be. Like, why, why would you be a footballer if you're not doing that? But it's uh, 
quite a I think it's probably one of the biggest problems uh, people get in in football is kind of separating themselves from from the rest when when things are going not as good like standard wise the move from um, Cyprus to Poland again you've had a two year deal there I think like they're again very different footballing cultures I suspect and, and um, different lifestyles what part of Poland was it was it one of the nice parts uh, it was no, it was a nice city small city um, I think it was about maybe 300,000 people but it, it was a it was a small city with a big catchment area around it um, like the actual city was, was very small the centre um, but it was no, it was good. I I enjoyed it. Football. When I went over there, was I probably went started too good, if anything. And then after that, the expectations were I had to score nearly every game. And then if I went a few games without scoring, it was I was the worst player they've ever had, kind of thing. Then you score a few goals, suddenly you're the best. So even things like that, I, I started to learn to deal with, like when. When things are going good, not to get ahead of yourself, and when they're going bad, you know that it just takes one game to kind of change things. Yeah, um, I often wonder with um, with players who are physically gifted like you are that there is that expectation that this guy's going to be able to pull something out of nowhere. When football is the ultimate team game, like you can only get on the end of a ball if there's a good move before that, or if there's a move that puts you in the right position. So is that something that has taken you a while to deal with, that level of expectation when somebody sees your physical size, that they automatically go, well, this guy's going to be good or he's going to be able to be effective for us, irrespective of whether or not the team are playing well? Um, yeah, exactly. There's, like, I mean, lots of teams now like to play with just one striker. So if I'm a striker playing up on my own, you are dependent on crosses, coming into the box from the wingers, maybe a number 10 sliding you in for chances. So you are dependent on the rest of the team, the, the other midfielders. Um, and sometimes if if whatever reason they can't get on the ball or the team doesn't has, have possession, then it can take you out of the game completely. Um, and then they're kind of just stuck to lumping the ball up to me. And if I, because of my height, I'm expected to win every single ball. So if I start to lose a few headers, then they're like, what's he doing? He's six foot, whatever, and he can't win a header kind of thing. And then just kind of all snowballs from that. But then I kind of go back to the the other part of it where I don't want to give excuses where if I'm not having a good game or I'm not getting the supply, I need to make sure any time I do get a chance or a ball does come up to me, that I have to do the best that I can when, when I do get that chance. Again, it sounds like the type of thing that will, you'll get better at as you work on. Like, I, you know, I often wonder about this, whether or not that's the type of stuff that like at 16 and 17 we should be telling players, you know, giving them at that age the introduction to sports psychology to say there will be times when things are not going your way and learning to think your way through that and to calm down when things are going badly is the most important aspect of resilience that we can give you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's massive. Um, for me, it's one of the... I would, don't know if I'd say a regret, but I wish I'd done it earlier on in my career just to kind of see where, what could have happened differently. Maybe if I was at a club like Celtic, at the time maybe I didn't really realise how big of a club it was or like how big a deal it was to play there or what it took to be a regular first-team player there. Um and I think that was probably one of my uh, problems in Scotland where I was just kind of just doing enough to to keep going and I kind of always knew I'd have clubs I've had in, I'd, I would have an interest. Uh, but to what you're saying about giving it to, to younger players, I think it's something that if you push on someone, they're not going to really buy into it. Yeah. They'll just go to it because they have to. I think it needs to be something where the players want to go and do it because if, if they're doing it the other way, they're not being honest with themselves or they're not being honest with whoever they're working with. Uh, I don't think it really works. Um, but definitely to introduce them to it or have put the idea into their heads, then obviously would it's a start to it, I think. 
Uh, Killian, obviously the, the debut went pretty well the other day. Uh, the New Zealand Herald says that you made yourself an instant hero arriving impressively off the bench as a second-half substitute. But I think the biggest credit given to you is via the reaction of your manager, Mark Rudin, who got a yellow card for his expletive shouted on the sideline. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't see I heard about it. I think there was something with... Uh, I think there was a bit of history with their manager and him from the last time they played. Uh, but their manager was actually... Marcus Babel, the Liverpool player. Nice. Wow. Um, yeah, but I, 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 I missed it all, obviously. I was celebrating, but one of the lads was saying afterwards it was quite funny. Like, I, the, I know you've um, only just got there, but the lifestyle apparently in New Zealand is absolutely amazing. Is this, like, is this potentially the last move for you? Is there a chance that maybe you settle down in one of these places? Uh, I have no idea. It's impossible to say in football. Um, and especially, I've only signed a six-month contract. It's only until the end of the season. So um, that's the other thing. It's every transfer window it can change. Um, when I left Poland, I left with it was for the Christmas break, the winter break that we have. So I was planning on just being back home for two weeks. So like my suitcase that I have here is, is closed for being in Ireland for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> So I've come, to, I've come to New Zealand in the middle of their summer with Irish winter clothes. So getting an extra summer yeah. though, that's pretty. That's pretty clever. You're definitely not going to get any uh, seasonal affection disorder. Uh, you've got a podcast going at the moment. Do you want to plug it there and let everybody know about it? Uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just doing it out of some free time. I think I'll have a bit more now. Uh, but yeah, hopefully I might get a bigger audience here with the. English speaking. I think in Poland it was a bit lost. No, they didn't care about it. So, uh, also, I might have to be a bit more careful about what I'm saying. So, well, if you're going to plug it, uh, tell us the name and where we can get it. Oh, yeah, Mr. Sherry podcast. M- Mr. Sherry is the podcast. Get it everywhere, everywhere. Good man, Killian. Best of luck with everything and uh, enjoy life down under. Cheers, man. All right, cheers, lads. Killian Sheridan there in Wellington in New Zealand, our Antipodean adventurer. Not a bad morning. Darren, how are you? Hi, very well, Jer. Very good this morning. Uh, who's not good? Burton manager Nigel Cuff. He says their players should hold their heads up high, though, despite making it and losing the League Cup semi final first leg 9 0. There was to be no fairy tale, even though they got to the last four, beaten by Manchester City comprehensively. We'll hear from Pep Guardiola in a moment, but first, here is Nigel Clough. It's out about the achievement of Burton Albion reaching the semi-finals of the League Cup. That's why we had several thousand supporters here tonight celebrating the fact that we probably will never be here again. That's how big the achievement is for us to, to make it to this point. Hate losing 9-0, but I think with what they had on the pitch tonight, it was nothing more than we expected. It was important to try to, to take advantage. We didn't expect to score so many goals, but it's, it's good for the terms of, OK, we are in the final. So after one last season, come back again in the less important trophy in the season means a lot for us. I don't think we did too much wrong, two or three of the goals. Um, certainly we could have done a bit better. Uh, a few of the goals have just dropped between three or four yellow shirts you know, to a blue shirt, but they're in the right place at the right time more often than not. So I don't think we did too badly tonight. But I think they can hold their heads up high. They had more shots against Manchester City last night than Newcastle managed uh, in their Premier League encounter in October, I think. That being said, Newcastle did score. It was only 3-1. So I think Newcastle probably did better than the 9 0 losing. Probably did better. But uh, they did have one less shot than Burton Albion. I don't know if you've been watching today's show, but he couldn't count downwards from five and he couldn't count from uh, 2015 to see 10 in a row. So Matt's not a strong point. No, I'm, I'm not talking. I'm saying that they had more shots than Newcastle had. I'm not had. talking. They had four. <laughs> Newcastle had three. Newcastle is, was probably better than 9 0 at 3 1. Which is a bigger number, four or three, Jer? I don't know. Um, Which is worse, 9 0 or 3 1? We've been through this, Darren. We've been through this. Michael Carrick says the Manchester United camp is much happier since the axing of Jose Mourinho. <laughs> since the special <laughs> ones' departure, the Red Devils have won five games on the spin. The much maligned Paul Pogba, who fell out of favour under Mourinho and appeared destined for an early exit from Old Trafford, was named the club's player of the month for December. Carrick is working with the coaching staff now and says removing Mourinho has helped turn things around. It's quite happy camp. It's winning football matches, you know, you can't. Uh, can't put a price on on that. What the, the, the feeling that gives you, and um, the confidence and the belief, and almost sense of calmness in a way when when you're winning when you're winning games. And um, it's great to see the lads enjoying themselves. And, and, and you know the football's flowing, the training's good, the, the bouncing around the place, and it's it's nice to see. Did he mention Mourinho by name at any point? No, 
OK, that's But he did enough. say he was very happy camp. Yeah, I mean, so long as he doesn't Much mention, happier than it was a month ago. There's no need for him to be pouring any fuel on the fire. I think everybody understands he can rise above this. Because he's definitely in the running for this job at some point in the future. Like, he's been groomed. He's been kept there straight away off the, the uh, playing staff to the coaching staff through a different number of um, regimes. And he survived that. So you would expect that he is somebody who the club has identified. No matter how badly you think that club is being run, at least they're thinking this guy somewhere along the way is going to be promoted from within. Or get a job elsewhere, which is the most likely scenario, of course. Do the Ryan Giggs on it, but Ryan Giggs was helped by a disastrous situation himself. So I, I, I can't see Michael Carrick being considered at the end of the season. It's the, the, no, probably, the, it's it probably, the next role. It probably comes too early for him, but like, you know, the club can say he's staying to the next manager. He's important. He's going to be part of your, your uh, backroom team, whether you like it or not, buddy. And that's one of the... Can you do that with a big manager? If well, not with a big manager, but you can do it with Oligo Solskjaer. Yeah, that would be a good one. Meanwhile, the Arsenal midfielder Aaron Ramsey has agreed to join Juventus in the summer. The Welshman will leave the Gunners on a free transfer when his contract expires at the end of the season. The 27-year-old claims the club withdrew the offer of fresh terms in the middle of negotiations, which left him with no choice but to leave the club. He says was kind of against his will to do so. Explaining what happened back in October, the Welshman said he was surprised that Arsenal retracted the offer. Everything had been going great with the club. We thought we were in a position where we had agreed a deal, but that's no longer the case. I mean, fair play to him. He's doing exactly the right thing. Yeah. Let your contract wind down. Take the boatload of cash that's coming your way in one go and treble your wages. Retracting yeah. an offer does seem a bit strange. I don't know if, I don't know if they want him, do they? No, not enough to pay him that much. It's I don't think they rate him as much as he rates or the rest of the world rates him. His agent rates him. I'm not, or, or Juve, which it turns out the market rates him. Well, it, it's, I'd like to know what the exact reasoning is for this. What is the plan B for Aaron Ramsey? Are they going into the market and are they prepared to offer what Aaron Ramsey needed to a player that they deem to be worthy of that money or better than Aaron Ramsey in their view? Because for me, there is sorting, sort of haunting uh, memories of the Emirates being built po and slash post-Emirates being Bill's era right here, where it's like, this player, we can't afford, goodbye. And it's not just this idea that they can achieve better things elsewhere, which is what a lot of them did, but just the simple idea that we can't afford you. Who's Aaron Ramsey? What type of player is he? Where does he play? And in what, what's your system when he's playing? I would say that in this idyllic world, you could almost have a situation where Aaron Ramsey and Mesut Ozil for Arsenal could have been David Silva and Kevin De Bruyne. But as I say, in a very idyllic world, I say in those roles in those the two advanced aid positions. That is, in my view, that's his best position. So I'm not sure what, uh, I'm not sure why that, no what's laughable about that. Well, but he's nowhere near as good as either of those players. That's not what I'm saying, I'm saying positionally. You're asking what position, I would yeah, say the two so advanced roles, those two positions. Why would you put a player who is not as good as your main rivals for the championship in that? Why would you lock yourself into playing this guy week in, week out, mm -hmm. when he's not as good as your main rivals player in that same position? Yeah, no, it's a fair point. I, so where the, does he the play? Thing, the thing like, is, Arsenal are not can't hold a candle to Manchester City. Yeah, at but the they have to be trying to. That's the like, not like that's the game. They're the rules of engagement here. You're trying to beat Man City, no? Yeah, no, it is. But like, we'll settle for this guy and this guy. There, there's there's a difference between settling for somebody uh, mid-season, which is what I, I think they should have come up with the money for Aaron Ramsey, seen out the season with him. There's no guarantee they'd make a top four. I'd like to have Aaron Ramsey in an Arsenal squad that might be going for a top four if they fail this season when they go into next season. Of all the players they've lost over the years, Ramsey would seem like the least likely to come back and, and bite them, or players they've, they've allowed to leave. Well, they wouldn't let him go to a Premier League club, so that's the idea behind not coming back to bite him. But it'll be interesting to see what Allegri does with him at Juventus. 36 million quid is what he's making from this transfer. 36 million. He has to go as well. There's no way he's getting 36 million quid from Arsenal. As a signing on fee for a new contract. That's well, that's the, that, no, that's the whole, that's the guaranteed money in the, when he puts pen to paper over the next five years, he'll earn 36 million. It's not bad. Not too bad at all. In rugby, the Leinster senior coach Stuart Lancaster believes Toulouse have become more dangerous since beating them earlier in the season. The top 14 team ended the Blues unbeaten streak with a 28-27 win way back in October. Since that game, the French side have gone on to win eight games and at one draw in that period. They currently sit second in the French top 14 table. Lancaster has warned that they're even better since the last time Leinster faced them. Just to you know, give context, so Toulouse's strengths really are lots, lots of different things, but one in particular is the counter-attack. So they've scored over half their tries, so there's no doubt our back three will be tested by their back three. Um, 
they're an outstanding. It's not. It's an out, not just an outstanding back three. It's an outstanding backline unit. You know, from Dupont outwards. Dupont is, you know, one of the best scrum halves. You know, I've coached against. Um, and then you go through the line. You've got Ramos. You've got Antomak. You've got um, Mada. You've got um, Ram. You know, the list goes on. Colby. Yeah, they're, they're outstanding uh, counter-attacking team. Now, finally, Pete Taylor believes his daughter Katie would never have turned pro had he remained as her coach. He stepped away from her corner in the autumn of 2015, having been at the Brave Fighters' side for over a decade. In that time, while Taylor was coach, Katie Taylor won Olympic gold, five world championships and 12 gold medals at European championships. He was speaking on Paddy Hoolan's No Shame podcast. I don't think she'd have gone pro if I'd have been still there. I don't know if you'd have won another gold medal in Rio if I wasn't... I wasn't the last major title she won was when I was there. Then I don't know if she'd have gone on, even if I was there, if she'd have won a, a Olympics. Like we broke up, and she 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 had she's good morals. Like in the end, she says, "Well, if 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 you split up, you split up with my mother, then I don't want you in my corner." So she knew that we what what the she knew what the um, outcome would be. I, th I think she knew that she'd be missing me in the corner, but she still had the morals. To go, still go ahead and do that. There's not many people that had risked losing and a European in Worlds in the Olympic title because by by not having a coat. Back in her man. Yeah. She put back that man. Yeah, she way, back yeah. the man. You know, so you risk your career, which she did do, but she still did it. So you've got to, you've got to, you've got to admire that as well. Um, the fact that she has turned pro has ended up being really good for her, and she's going to make loads of money. And uh, she's gonna have a second career beyond what she would have had in the amateurs. Like she's doing to professional boxing what she did to amateur boxing, which is basically putting it on the map. Yeah, and she's cemented her legacy really because she was seen as this. She, like you said, Jerry, put amateur boxing on the map, but in the professional stakes, while there have been some doubts about the caliber of the opponent she's faced, she has taken on all challengers and done so quite impressively. Particularly after bouncing back from her disappointment at the last Olympics, where it looked like she was. A shell of the fighter she had been previously. Yeah, and she was, yeah. You done? That's me. All right, good stuff, Darren. Thanks for that. Let's uh, move on to uh, the annual fixture between Ireland and England Legends, which returns to Dublin this year. It's going to be played on February the 1st, the night before the Six Nations fixture between Ireland and England at the RDS. So obviously Ireland against England uh, is sold out at the Aviva, but if you want to experience some good quality rugby the night before in the RDS it is the Ireland Legends against the England Legends tickets are available on ticketmaster.ie at the moment and you should uh, go along and get some for it because it's for an amazing cause Doddy Weir was in Dublin this week ahead of the match he uh, obviously played with Scotland and with the Lions and was diagnosed with motor neuron disease in 2016 since then he's been talking openly about that diagnosis and the difficulties and also the challenges faced by anybody who has uh, MND at the moment. So the proceeds from the game are going to be split between the My Name's Dottie Foundation and a number of other charitable causes, including many here in Ireland as well. So tickets for that match are available on Ticketmaster.ie. Here is our chat with Dottie Weir. Have a look. So take us back to the 23rd of December 2016, I think. You mentioned your diagnosis there. Uh, talk to us about that day. Yeah, that was really the best day in anyone's life who gets diagnosed with something, but it, it probably goes back to a year previous to that. I got my hand stuck in the door and I thought I'd broken a bone because I lost a bit of power in my left hand. That continued for three months and I thought, oh, oh, certain things have not healed up here. Skin started twitching and that's a kind of giveaway that went on to the, the dreaded Google and it came up, you've got MND. And, and with that, I didn't know really much about it. I knew that a, f a fellow colleague used to find the best season who plays number nine for South Africa or dead, sadly not here because he's recently died of MND. I knew that he had it, so what you do, you Google it and find out the effect and that's when you, you get a bit nervous that because there's a terminal issue, there is no cure. So on the back of that, I had to go through a number of tests. So you get a lumbar puncture, you get shock therapy, blood tests, brain scans, and funnily enough, they never found anything in the brain before anyone says anything, as all my rugby colleagues said, there was no brain there. So then, on, on, with all the accumulation of these tests on the 23rd, you get told officially that you've got MND. And to me, I expected it, so it wasn't a major problem for myself, but for my good lady, I was hoping that that would never be. So, so she was a bit upset. But the worst thing about it is that the professor said, there's a nurse, there, she'll look after you because there's pretty much nothing we can do. And in a year's time, you'll probably come into this clinic in a wheelchair. So that makes life pretty nerve-wracking because I've got three young kids. 
uh, or teenage kids uh, and on the back of that you don't know how long you'll have to live whether it's three months, six months, a year, ten years and then that's the worrying how you're going to protect and look after your family because your whole, whole body kind of disappears in front of you and, and it is so with that we had a bit of a fight to go and enjoy ourselves while you can and never had a bad party and we've been invited to a lot of parties since and with that the fight and the journey is certainly to make people aware of the condition and to try and raise some funds so that our foundation can spend on much needed research um, to try and find this this ultimate cure. Mm. Your book, My Name's Dolly, it's called as well, is a fantastic read and just reading it last year, you speak about that Christmas of 2016 which was a very interesting time because you'd just been given the diagnosis on the 23rd, your mother was suffering from cancer at the time and you had this decision to make about whether or not to tell your family before Christmas that you'd been diagnosed with MND. Can you talk to us a little bit about that Christmas and the sort of mixed emotions and the sort of conflict in your own head about whether or not to tell people that Christmas? Well, <laughs> yes, thanks, so, yeah, thanks, yeah, that, that, with, with where we are, there's been a major, a major emotional sort of journey as well we're on, and we decided not to tell anyone because of my mum's condition, because of my condition is what it was, there's nothing you can do about it, so we decided, to, my good lady and I, just to keep it quiet till the beginning of January, once Christmas is over, because Christmas is just a massive family gathering, and to have one issue uh, in the family with mum and her cancer, they didn't want to be burdened with MND because we all know when you get MND it's, it's an absolute disaster because there is no cure. Everyone who has MND is going to go and look for a self-cure, which I think is absolutely disgraceful. So there's nothing there that the professors or the doctors are prescribing to people with MND. So, so there was nothing, there wasn't going to be a benefit to myself, a good lady, for announcing it at the family table. But what did happen is the kids pretty much got well spoilt that year because we just weren't sure what was around the corner. If it would actually make January, whether it would make April, June. So on the back of that, it was quite difficult mentally and emotionally because we didn't know what this issue would, would really give me and whether I'd still be here. But two years on, very fortunate for some reason because some other sufferers uh, sadly maybe have two, three months and, and they're no longer with us. So this is why this fight's been prolonged, it's been great, the support behind the scenes has been amazing uh, and long may it continue but hopefully in the short term we will get a cure. But yeah, that Christmas stays in the back of, and it's easier writing in the book I think uh, of what we went through because it was definitely a, a quite a difficult and traumatic time but uh, we came out of it, we're still here, we're still enjoying our time with the family. We've had another Christmas, which has been absolutely amazing. And two Christmases since. Yeah, two Christmases since. So the kids are maybe not so handy now because they don't get quite as spoiled as they did then. So I don't think they're quite as happy, but uh, so be it. And, and at least they've got their dad they can still celebrate with, which other people in this horrible condition don't have. So we take that on board and enjoy every day for what it is. How hard was it for you to get to the extremely positive mindset that you're in now? You said there a few moments ago you're one of the lucky ones, which is a remarkably positive outlook to have. Well, you don't think when you, when you have a massive session, okay, and you've got the most horrendous hangover, and you see somebody with a bigger hangover, you feel okay. Well, that's, that in a, in a simplistic way, is, is my sort of mindset, that I am where I am. I'm 48 years of age, my kids are all teenagers, but we got an email in a wee while ago from someone in, in Yorkshire who had MND and he was 38. He had two kids, two and five, and he got told in September 2017 and died in December 2017. So when you hear stories like that, what have I got to grumble about? Because for him and the family, horrific. Mm. I'm still here with mine, I'm 10 years further on, and there's a lot of stories like that. So just enjoy yourself when you come, stop grumbling, and, and, and get on with it, and that's my positive outlook and with that, is that why I'm still here? I really don't know, difficult to say, but with that um, I am, I've got the most amazing team behind me that are doing some great things and the 1st of February I think you, you'll see that as well as the, the team are coming out, Scotland, Ireland against England, which will be a magnificent occasion and um, I think I'm looking forward to that as, as one of the, the great events this year. So one of the last things I just wanted to ask you about was you mentioned that you've put down three Christmases since your diagnosis, 2016, 17, 18 years, and on the 23rd of December 2016, that professor you mentioned there a moment ago said you wouldn't be walking when you come in to visit me in a year's time. Do you feel that proving him wrong has given you a great boost? 
Yeah, definitely, and I think that's the world we're in. Uh, proven and wrong, still here two years down, but, but he is, is a great professor, and I think that's what's unique about this disease, is no one actually knows. He could have been right uh, in saying that, and he's maybe propelled my, my strength and my thoughts to, to, to try and outthink him or outdo him. And the reason being as well, we, we, we work with each other, and I spoke to the J9 Foundation, which is the youth fund of Essen, because he's done a lot for MND, and with that, what did he do to try and secure and keep himself going? And he's been around the world doing every sort of kind of injection one could do for MND. And with that, it didn't work. But his team said the thing that kept him going was positive thinking. And, and that's what I've taken on board. I see a chiropractor once a week and he says, if you don't use it, you lose it. So with the muscles in your hands, try and do as much as you can. So tying shoelaces, for example, is a big thing for me. But then I keep doing it, it might take me five minutes, but I do it and boom, that's, that's our success. Mm. Drinking a pint, I can't really do it with one hand, so we've got to do it with two hands now. So we've got to adapt and that's the kind of thing in the spirit you've got to have. But the spirit really is is to try and make a difference and try and I just think it's outrageous in today's environment that there's not even one new drug in 25 years has hit the table to give people with MND a chance and with a chance you need options and there is no options so with that we want to try and change that I've got nothing to lose to go and speak to some of these professors but really it's down to the team behind to say a massive thank you for the support and generosity because it was for them it gives me a boost also brings in much needed finances so we can invest. So take us back to the 23rd of December, 20th. Let's just leave there. Okay, so that was the end of our Dotty Weir interview. A reminder that tickets are available for the Ireland England Legends game, which takes place the night before Ireland play England in the Six Nations. That game is in the RDS. You can just go on Ticketmaster uh, or you can just Google Ticketmaster Ireland England Legends. You'll find it there. And uh, you, there are plenty of tickets left available for the RDS on the 1st of February and um, look there's a superstar cast of former England players a bunch of former Scottish players are now playing I presume they play for Ireland against England yes as we unify against the enemy of, the enemy of my enemy is my friend yeah or maybe they play for England that would be a bit weird no they're playing for Ireland yeah okay that's fair enough um, yeah so a bunch of Ireland and Scottish legends playing against England some big names already confirmed, and we'll confirm the names as we go along uh, in advance as well and get more information on that to you. So if you want to go along and have um, a good night out on the Friday night and support a very good cause, um, Duddy Weir seemed very um, fit and well, considering he's a man who is going through the uh, diagnosis of MND at the moment. Yeah, it's incredible, really. It's uh, to have that level of positivity, to be able to say that I'm one of the lucky ones, uh, is just incredible, really. The, the strength of that man is incredible. It's just reading his book, My Name's Dolly, it's called for anybody who's, who's interested in picking it up and just speaking to him there the other day. It's just, he's just a man of incredible strength. Anybody who, who goes through that and manages to have that outlook in life is incredible, really. And he just maintains that great sense of humour that he has. And um, he was in great form the other day. Like it's, it's just such, such a dreadful condition. It's, it's impossible to kind of even comprehend what, uh, what he must be going through. Yeah. Um, you were talking about Colin Murray. Yeah, like just kind of even reminding myself of the Colin Murray story this, this, um, this week because I think it's kind of important to kind of look at this and look at how people have dealt with this and how they speak about it and one of the lines that kind of stuck out to me from the documentary made about him by RTE a couple of years ago was that when he was told that he'd been diagnosed with motor neuron disease it, he was told that it was progressive it was incurable and it was in terminal and it was terminal it P I T and he said it very much was the pits when he was told it and that was kind of a line that kind of sticks out to you like it's it's one thing being told that but telling your friends and family that you've got a, a terminal disease that's progressive and is totally incurable is, is something else. And like Dottie says it there, what is it, 20, 25 years since the, the only drug uh, has, has come along. So any sort of funding, any sort of uh, help to, to aid the research into this terrible, terrible condition uh, would be greatly appreciated from everybody, really. Yeah, OK, let's move on. We're going back to the uh, big story from Cork Football. Obviously, they've uh, announced their plans to try and just improve the state of the game in Cork. Tony Lean, the sports editor of the Irish Examiner, is on the line with us this morning. Tony, good morning to you. How are you doing? Hi, Ger. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, the, the main thing about this is that uh, Cork Football has realised that they have an issue and they've tried to get some of their more storied 
former players and managers together mm -hmm. and build a committee, build a proper brains trust and just start from ground zero? Well, exactly. Um, I mean, really, Jared, at any point over the last kind of four or five years, you know, you could have said we need to do this and I suppose like the obvious thing to say is it's overdue, but, you know, they've got to start somewhere with this and I probably think actually last summer when you actually look back at it, I mean, they took a hiding from Kerry in Parky Cueve and, you know, people were saying, oh, this is this can't get any worse. And I think Eamon Fitzmaurice actually said afterwards, I think people forgot on that night, actually Kerry actually played very well. But I think the real, the real, I think, you know, turning point was in the qualifier subsequently against Tyrone, like where there was just an absolute acceptance. They were pummeled by Tyrone. They looked like absolutely rudderless caught people in the crowd, you know, there was a resignation there that day that even I've never seen, you know, I mean, you know, you, you know, we talk about this Corkness thing, and I know you were chatting about it earlier, and, you know, that was a day for me where, you know, the Corkness, the whole thing was gone, it had reached really the nadir for me in terms of, okay, you know, we need to start, we need to start again here because this is really bad, you know, Cork football, you know, may not be a Kerry or a Dublin but they've still won, you know, they're still number four in terms of, you know, All-Ireland's won after Galway. So this is not what Cork is about, like, and we actually must actually do something. And and in getting the likes of, of Conor Cunahan and Graham Canty and Brian Cuthbert, I mean, you know, you're talking about serious people delivering good proposals. So there will be, Jerry. you know, because especially with the view there is of Cork football within the county at the moment, there will be a bit of eyes thrown to heaven and kind of, you know, oh yeah, whatever about this. But I mean, I would actually say, hold on a second, you know, give this a chance. Let's see what this is. It's over five years. There's deliverables in year one. There's deliverables in year two. I mean, let's actually see, do they turn a corner and what turning that corner actually means? Uh, you know, I mean, Tracy Kennedy was speaking yesterday about making Cork competitive again. And, I think that's important. Like, it's not about like they're going to win a senior All Ireland. Let's actually start maybe with minor All Irelands, you know, or under twenty All Irelands, or getting to semi finals in those grades, and then build it up to Super Eights and semi finals and seniors. So this isn't a quick fix by any means. It's it's it isn't a quick fix. Obviously, you know, the name of the plan is for a reason. Is to Cork twenty twenty four, but they do have to start somewhere. And I think, in fairness, people should actually give them the room and the time and the space to actually make progress bit by bit. No, I, I think you're right, Tony. And like you mentioned uh, our discussion about Corkness earlier on, kind of quite tongue-in-cheek about it, but there is a serious point there that when Cork have swagger, you realise how important it is to the whole county. Look at the hurlers a couple of years ago when they won the Munster title. Everybody around the country, I think, was happy to see the sea of red swarming onto the pitch when they won the Munster title on that particular occasion. It is something, when, so when, you, when you use the term success breeds success, it is never as true as it is in Cork. Yeah, like Corkness is a thing. You know, I mean, look, I've been surrounded by it on the sports desk, like, you know, the good side of it, like, for 20 years. I mean, if if, if I can create a, a picture for you, there's a great dynamic in our sports desk. You have two Kerry men and a Tipperary fella on one side of the sports desk, and you have a raft of Cork people on the other side of the sports desk. And it's great back and forth. And you see, you know, as Tracy Kennedy alluded yesterday to that confidence that just keeps on the right side of arrogance most of the time. Now, obviously, and unfortunately, you know, you delve into social media and Twitter and you actually see it flip over the other side uh, of the fence, you know, into, into a different kind of an attitude. But I think, broadly speaking, there is that self-awareness, um, you know, there is that self-confidence. And, you know, Brian Cuthbert, actually, in fairness to him, articulated it really well yesterday when he said, like, you know, if we don't have that we're the same as everybody else, and we do not want to be the same as everybody else. And I think it was Tracy Kennedy, in, you know, in the introduction to the report, made that point and brought that subject up. She basically felt, you know, we've stopped caring about football and we've lost our corkness. And, you know, in the first instance, we need to get that back. Obviously, there are several layers of technical detail, you know, that are being worked on. But purely from a human, emotional point of view, I mean, that's a very core thing, and they need to have it, I think, to be successful. 
You, sorry, you, you mentioned the, the Cork CCC, which which is your term in the examiner this morning, Cunahan County and Cuthbert. Mm. My initial thing is seeing them in those photo opportunities yesterday and thinking to myself, what is their actual role in this? Because they're three of potentially the best minds they have in Cork football. Yeah. Is there going to be a role for the three of them in this programme? Yes, there is. Um, you probably, um, you probably, um, I'm, I'm sure probably you did own see Eamon Fitzmaurice's interview there in our paper a couple of weeks ago where he was actually making that point about he thinks one of the biggest mistakes Cork football has made in the last number of years was getting rid of Brian Cuthbert um, in 2015. I mean, it was only yesterday, and I mean, this is important, I think, in the context of where Cork football is at and where it can be at. I was only looking back yesterday at statistics, like in 2015, like which is only like three seasons ago, um, Cork won three of their National League games in Division 1. They were extremely unlucky through a, a mathematical equation on the final day to be relegated. You know, Owen, as well as I do, that they should have won the Munster final in Killarney that day. I mean, it was another series of fluky circumstances stopped them. So, like, Cork football was at a point there, like, where it was winning half its games in Division 1 under Brian Cuthbert. No, I'm not saying everything is down to the fact that Brian Cuthbert left, but Cork football has had a habit of shooting itself in the foot many times over the last number of years. It's a point I've heard Cullum Cooper make several times. Like, why can't they actually put a result on top of a result? It, you know, so there is actually scope there. They're not, and this was something Conor Cunahan pointed out yesterday when he was talking about, you know, minors getting beaten uh, by Kerry by a point last year and Kerry going on to win the All-Ireland. It's not that Cork are a million miles away. But, like, you know, the key has been, you know, and not to put too fine a point in it, like, getting their shit together. And, mm. and this, basically, I think, this document and the involvement of these people, serious people, as you said, like Canty and Coon and All-Ireland winners, like, eight, nine years ago, this document is a realisation of that. This document actually says, enough is enough. We need to start from the bottom up again. And this time, we need to put the foundations and the structures in place because there's an acceptance, and, and the lads were even making the point yesterday, because of the size of Cork, because of the supposed tick and the numbers that they have, once in a while, they're always going to almost stumble on a group of talented players, you know, and knit them together. And, you know, you've seen that manifest itself in, in minor teams in recent years where Kerry have been streets ahead of everybody else in the country and yet have only beaten Cork by a point twice in the last four years. So they have occasionally had that ability to, to knit a team together, but it hasn't come from anything that's actually structured and, you know, very much set in place. And I think that's what Tracy Kennedy was saying yesterday. We need to actually formalise this structure. We need to make sure that this is something that carries us not just to 2024, but it's a process that carries us, carries us well beyond it. One of the things that you mentioned at the start of this conversation, Tony, was how maybe people within Cork aren't fully aligned. That the, the, the county seems a little bit split between its hurling pockets and its football pockets. And we see the same a little bit in reverse in, in Dublin. You kind of still haven't quite seen the Dublin hurling yeah. inter-county set up match what the football um, team can do. And, and maybe they'll close the gap and maybe uh, we'll see what the work that Maddie Kennedy does that continues on what Packy Roy is doing. But just to... to um, Tease that out a little bit. Is there is there still a very defined split between hurling and football within Cork? Yeah, it's a great point, sir. I mean, there was I forget who actually made the point yesterday, but uh, it was a very pertinent point. You are not going to change 130 years of tradition over the next five years in Cork. And the person who said that was making the point that you know. In their heart and in their heads, large swathes of Cork will always be hurling first. Listen, I know it better than most. I've be, I've be, I'm involved in a club, in a dual club in Cork. And you, as a football person, you constantly feel you are just, you know, that the, the wind is always just against you a small bit. Now, there are areas of the county, and I'm, obviously I'm talking about West Cork, where that flips completely where, you know, down around Ross Carberry and Castlehaven and Skibbereen, it's very much like football 80, you know, hurling 20. There are parts of the county where it's 50-50, but certainly, Ger, you know, in the most populous areas, which are the city, which are East Cork, you know, I mean, which are even mid-Cork, like the Carriga Lines and these places, you know, you still have that mentality. And unfortunately for football, what has happened, and what I would 
called the embarrassments that the footballers have suffered over the last number of years you know has even has, has probably only driven you know a greater portion of the GA supporting public to the hurlers because you know whatever happens with the hurlers you always feel that you're going to get your value for money whereas people have actually just stopped going to watch the Cork footballers and I think it again it was Tracy Kennedy uh, and I'm paraphrasing her here but I think her basic point seems to be what has happened with the Cork football supporting public is, well, we're going to opt out emotionally because at least if we opt out emotionally and we don't go, then we can't get hurt by what we see. So, I mean, you know, we can we can laugh and joke and, you know, about Corkness and all that kind of stuff. Like, But that side of it is very real. You know, there's nobody in sport wants to support a team where, you know, they're actually squeamish about going and actually cringing watching what they are watching. And, I, and that's why I mentioned that Tyrone game to you last summer. I just felt, you know, you had you had a situation where it had really just bottomed out. And, and I know an awful lot of those Cork players, and there's an awful lot of those Cork players are really, really good players. And, and, and there's, there's another crop of young players coming through. So the situation isn't hopeless, but as I said, it just needed something, somebody, or this particular group to pull the threads together. And if you actually get something going again, and that's what they're trying to do, that the court public will buy into, they will buy into it. And, you know, it, 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 it's not then a question of, are you a hurling person or are you a football person? The debate then reverts to what Brian Cuthbert was saying, and that is, are you a court GA person? And we'll support our teams if they are giving us what we expect of them. Yeah, like the, the uh, hurling football divide is fascinating. And I do uh, think from reading yesterday, the report yesterday, that there might be some attempt at tackling this. I'm not sure what your take on this is, Tony, but one of the plan, um, one of the plans aims to have football taught in all primary schools in Cork mm. as part of the PE curriculum with all primary schools offering Gaelic football as an after-school activity. What are the hurling schools going to think of that? Well, that was actually the very question Owen I asked myself yesterday because, again, but isn't... I suppose I'm almost guilty then of the mentality that we're criticising even by asking that question yesterday because even though everyone is looking for a united front and a togetherness, I know as well as everybody else knows that hurling people, and I'm talking about died in the wool 100% hurling people who might say to you that I'll puncture a football if it comes inside the gates of my club, straight away their attitude of this is going to be, oh, hold on a second, all this, all this stuff... All these appointments, everything, this primary school, specific teaching of Gaelic football. Uh, what about hurling? Hurling is, a, is, is the first love of everybody in the county. Tracy Kennedy very much tried, well, very much. She attempted, certainly, to nail that on the head yesterday, as did the other people. Everybody was saying, this is a Cork thing. This is not a football thing. This is not a hurling thing. It just happens to be that at this moment in time, football is in far greater need of help, assistance and a solid foundation than hurling is. And that is true. That is undeniable, even from hurling people. Inter-county hurling is in a far better place in Cork at the moment than inter-county football is. That shouldn't be the case. You look at somewhere like Galway where they have it pretty even. Ger, you mentioned Dublin. You are always going to have... I think you were always going to have that tilt one way or the other. I would say what they're looking for, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but it, at the moment, you know, you were talking, it's 75-25 hurling football in Cork. If they can get it back to 60-40, I think that's the kind of thing where you're talking about. That's what they're actually looking at. But even leaving hurling out of the debate, I think everybody at this moment has just got blinkers on, and they were saying... Football is in dire trouble in Cork at the moment. It's not that it's, it's, it's a hopeless situation. It is salvageable, but the way things are going, you know, it's not going to get any better on its own. We have to actually fix it. I mean, Graham Canty is a really deadpan kind of a guy, but he's a very, very thoughtful, serious guy. I mean, you can see how he captained an All-Ireland winning team. And I said to him yesterday, I mean, so where do you think Cork are at the moment? And, you know, deadpan... Canty just basically said, well, you know, we're mid-table in Division 2, which puts us about 12th in the country. We are outside the top 10. I think that's about right. It's a long time, lads, since Cork 
was outside the top 10 counties yeah. in football in this country. Tony, one last point. Like, um, I'm, I've been just reading a little bit about the response to the Blue Wave when the Dubs published it, and John Costello had to come out and basically attack everybody, uh, attack being the best form of defence, because there was so much about uh, how cocky they were, talking about winning one All-Ireland every three years, mm. and how oh, that was ridiculous, it was never going to happen, um, even from within, a bit from within the county. There, there will be naysayers, but actually, Gaelic football desperately needs Cork to be competitive at the top tier for the next decade because otherwise, we're going to be getting used to watching Dublin and maybe one other team competing year in, year out, and that gets boring real quick, as we already know. Yeah, you see, and the man beside you there in the studio, Ger, will attest to this. You see, Kerry are actually Kerry take Cork football more seriously than any other county, and I mean, I know people take the piss out of that kind of a statement. But it's actually true because we're we're living beside it. And when you hear someone like an Eamon Fitzmaurice saying, you know, you know, Cork is the game, the first game that we absolutely get up for every year, you must remember that comes against the backdrop of Fitzmaurice going to college in UCC. And so Paul Ganey going to college in UCC and David Morn working on the South Mall in Cork. And these people, these Kerry people, understand the Cork psyche and they understand that at any given moment in time, you know, they can produce a performance and they can take down a serious big outfit on any given day. Now, they seem to have lost that capacity to do that in the last couple of years, but it has always been there in the past. Like, so, I mean, in terms of you saying, Ger, about them getting back and everybody needing them, there's no doubt that everybody actually needs them because... They keep sides honest. That's the best way I'd put about Cork. You know, three, four years ago, I mean, Dublin playing Cork, Dublin wouldn't be taking that for granted. Kerry wouldn't be taking that for granted. Donegal, Mayo wouldn't. At the moment, Cork are in a position, Cork football are in a position where you basically almost take them for granted. And that's not a good place for Cork to be in, and it's really not a good place for any opposition to be in, and it's definitely not a good place for Gaelic football to be in. I have one last one for you, sorry. Um, mm. you, you guys have basically effectively uncovered the whole uh, funding situation with regards to Porky Cueve, and, and without the examiner we probably wouldn't know anything about the, the difference in the figures that Croke Park are telling mm. us from mm. what um, the Cork County Board have been telling us recently. Yeah. It's a bad time to be looking for investment because ultimately this will work if they get investment. We saw that money in equals output in Dublin GAA over a sustained period of time as long as there's good organisational skill and I've no doubt that Tracy Kennedy and the people who were there yesterday are exactly the right type of people to organise this. So will there actually be money to send the coaches in to coach Gaelic football in all of the primary schools? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's the very, it's the very point I made myself in, 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 in the piece in, in today's paper in, in terms of I think the window of opportunity, uh, Ger, in terms of the public's buy-in for this is quite slim. And I think that's the reason is because they've just lost patience and they've lost trust uh, in the administrative side of Cork GA. They've also lost trust, by the way, in the Cork footballers. So, you know, it's a particularly, you know, thin sheet of ice that they're on here. And I do think they need to get it really right from the start. I said that, and I do believe so also going you know, speaking to your point there, that the very first appointment out of the gate is going to be the high performance director, which is somebody who's going to basically oversee all the S and C on all the inter county teams in Cork. It's a hugely important appointment. And if they don't get that up and running, if they don't get that advertised, if they don't get that salaried and appointed in the first couple of months, I guarantee you and I guarantee Tracy Kennedy, people are just going to switch off in Cork to this and it's going to say Typical Cork GA bullshit, typical Cork football, you know, can't get their ducks in a row, forget about it, I'm not getting involved in that, no, I'm not, I'm not investing any emotion in that. So we're, we were very pointed yesterday in asking the questions, who funds those appointments, who actually writes the checks, and Tracy Kennedy was very specific in saying, these checks will be written by Cork County Board this is not a Crow Park thing. This is not a National GA thing. The stadium issue is one issue. She made a commitment, Ger, at convention. Um, I'm not certain it was the wisest commitment, but she made a commitment at convention that the stadium debt would not affect the day-to-day -day running uh, of Cork GA. Well, this is the first litmus test of that. These appointments, they're, they're talking about five appointments. 
my, my understanding is at least three and possibly four of them are going to be salaried appointments. So, like, you're still going to be talking, whatever way you, you, you slice and dice the figures, you're still going to be talking about two, three hundred grand of salaried appointments. Let's get the first one, the high performance one. Let's see how they manage with that one. The county board meeting is the 29th to ratify this report. Once that report is ratified, they then say they're going out in February. They're advertising the position. It doesn't have to be a court person, they said. They'll get the very best person for the job. And if they get that up and running, they get that person in place. Then all of a sudden, you've started something. You know, you've actually started actually getting people involved. People on the ground are saying, oh, yeah, this thing is up and running, and maybe then you get some buy-in. But if you don't get that right in the first instance, believe me, the court public will switch off. Tony, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers, Joe. Right. That's Tony Lee in the Sports Editor of the Irish Examiner. Yeah, a couple of things kind of coming to mind from that. First of all, that uh, 2015 Munster final, which Tony was actually on off the ball that day. He was on the pay-per-view alongside Mike Quirk, or I know, because I was working at it. And it was also the day... Uh, Wishy Fogarty gave that very famous ah, right. uh, speech to Joe. Yeah. How that moment, how that day is potentially, when we look back on it, one of the biggest sliding doors moments uh, in the history of Cork football. Because if they'd won that day, Brian Cuthbert would have stayed on. It would have been seen as a successful season. Who knows what they would have done in terms of improving over the next couple of years. But then with this today, you would suspect that, or yesterday, if this does come to fruition with a huge uh, amount of success for Cork football or for them to become one of the top four teams in the country once again, they might actually look on that as, uh, as a blessing in disguise, the way that it started a spiral out of control, which, ha- which has happened to Cork football in, in the last three seasons. Uh, the second thing that he said there that uh, kind of caught my ear was the idea that currently 35% of Cork's population play football. It's still 190,000 people. So if they get that up to 40%, which he says is the aim, they peak above 200,000 people, which is almost the entire population uh, of Galway. I think Galway have a population of 230,000, 240,000 people. They, like, you just can't understate, so we can't overstate the resources. Like, if forget them for a moment, that Cork have at their disposal to actually to kind of really cement themselves as a contender every single year if they get their house in order. Yeah, it's funny that they're not asking for central GAA money when what the Dubs did in their period was specifically ask for the same funding as a province. In the Blue Wave, one of the main things was that um, we have the size and population of a province, we need the uh, voting power and the um, investment that a province gets. Now, they got a load of money from Croke Park, um, and they still get a load of money from Croke Park, and there's a case that Cork should get at least pro rata what Dublin get, considering it actually does have uh, All-Ireland winners in both codes in the last 15 years. My question is, has Cork football ever been in order? In my lifetime, I'm not sure they have been, like, given the great teams they have. The late uh, 80s, early 90s. Like, were, were they just teams that kind of put their head above water for a moment and like... Well, they stole Kildare's best players, obviously, to get to that level, but, you know, we, we're not bitter. Singular. Players, to shape A. Ah, yes. Um, and, well, like, I mean... Larry's a Corkman, really. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, Just that first 16 years of his life when he lived in Kildare. Like, great teams will inadvertently win all Irelands once in a while, but getting great teams to actually sustain that level and win multiple all Irelands is the real test. Like, that Cork team was on the way to becoming one of the best teams to ever not win in all Ireland until they did it in 2010. Like, Mayo is, over the last couple of years, is the other team you could put into that uh, bracket that there has always been a constant sense of could they have done even more? Late yes, 80s, yes, granted. Yes. Oh. Like, but I, I do wonder if that came from just a great team rather than a great structure. Like if, it, they'd, if they'd beaten Kerry in any one of those All-Ireland finals, then that team would have fulfilled its, its destiny. They would have been a great team. They would have won two All-Irelands. But they weren't. They just choked every time against Kerry in those All-Ireland finals. Mm. You can't really blame a, a county structure for that, can you? Maybe you can. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Like it's it's hard to get into the, the the little details of all Ireland finals and actually blame it on a structure. Like it's possible <laughs> to do that. You just don't know what 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 additional Sorry, uh, I mean, players might have had. I'm reading this comment, Mary Cregan, on Cork GAA. After the win, everyone around the country was happy to see the Cork fans on the pitch. Go home, Owen. You're obviously sleep deprived. The second best thing to watching my own county win is watching Cork lose. <laughs> Hashtag OTBAM. I don't where know where is, Mary's uh, from. Where is Mary's from? We know where Mary's from. <laughs> I, mean, she I was could literally uh, 31 counties. I'm not sure she's right. I'm not sure was uh, was actually happy to see that, or was it kind of like, wow, I forgot what Cork invading a pitch looked like. When was this? 2016, I want to say. I'm sure somebody would have corrected me. What game were they? In the when, pitch when they won the Munster final in hurling. 
It, oh, just, yeah. it just felt like it had been a long time up until 2016, and it probably hadn't been that long at all. Yeah. Um, I'm open to correction on all of that. I do remember thinking two years ago, so 2016, yeah, at this point, that's, that, that, that looked good, seeing Cork back and, and back with a bang. Uh, patronising uh, t- I'll do these in order okay so Kevin Donahue on uh, Doddy Weir says what a fantastic man hashtag OTBM Ian Robbo on Twitter says he's such a top bloke I know someone who does a lot f- or for work for his charity and the stories he's told of how Doddy has approached this are inspirational hashtag OTBAM so yeah get on Ticketmaster if you want to go to that game and support that cause Mary Crehan says I did that one uh, Ian O'Reilly says should Owen not be delighted that Kerry are going to get a decent game before the Super 8s yeah. I would love me to come back as a Dublin fan. Well, this is the... Bang on the money. This is the colonial patronisation, patriarchal bullshit that the rest of us have to put up with. It's patronising now. Oh, wouldn't it be great? We get an old game, get an old kick out, and then kick the yeah. ball back to us. It'd be great. How great would that be? Bricks. It'd be so good. <laughs> you are a bunch of pricks. <laughs> Uh, Jimmy Armstrong says, uh, Killian must really like travelling Wellington, have at least a 2,000 mile round trip to every away game. Wow. That's a lot of jet lag. Uh, I'd say they start games slowly. <laughs> Probably or else you just get like a week-long camp in every city. Maybe, yeah. Uh, Martin Farry says, Great interview this morning with Ireland's ultimate professional football hipster, Killian Sheridan on OTBAM. Best of luck at Wellington Phoenix FC. Like a phoenix from the flames. Alphonsus McGuire, what a great name. Sell Ozil and keep Ramsey. At least Ramsey puts in the effort and plays for the shirt. Get rid of both of them. Get rid of both of them. If you don't think they're good enough to win a league, get rid of both of them. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe they are. I don't believe they are. I, 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 I admire your ambition. I just... And I know like you, you pointed out the contradiction in my point here that the idea of selling Aaron Ramsey is reminiscent of... Well, they're getting nothing po- post for him. post yeah. Sorry, getting, like, not, not giving him the, the wages he wants. It feels like post-Emirates, Wenger-era Arsenal. But the contradiction in that is... If he's not good enough to win the league, will I keep him? Yeah. So like, I, I take your point, and I, I think. I think accept it. Well. Don't worry about it. No, I'm not apologising. My moment. Like, j- just you wait to see the average midfielder they sign in in his stead. They've been pretty good in the transfer window. Transfer under so far, whoever's buying yeah. now is better than they were. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced that they'll easily find a replacement for Aaron Ramsey, who is immediately better than Aaron Ramsey. They yeah. might find a Matteo Guendouzi type who might be good in two, three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, and maybe that's maybe if you're going to win the league, you need Aaron Ramsey to come off the bench or to start 15 games. That would be my thinking, but clearly the business model there doesn't say that he deserves those wages to sit on the bench. Yeah, you're going to pay 36 million for that for the next five seasons. It's probably what you need to pay to win a Premier League. Like you, what, for a squad what, what's, what's Ilkay Gundogan earning? What's Gabriel Jesus earning? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know what Jesus is earning. It would, what's two, it's 10 million a year. It's actually more than that. It's 50 million over five years. Like they're... But Gabriel Jesus is competing with Sergio Aguero. Yeah, but, and Aaron Ramsey will be competing for a starting spot. You can't just say he's going to sit on the bench forever. Well, you, you pay your strikers more than you pay your midfielders. True. So maybe, uh, maybe... It's still an offensive position. It's not a whole pile of difference. Keen Ryan has been obviously sampling uh, Stapo's um, tweets. Being captain, in inverted commas, of a golf team, in inverted commas, is one of the most made-up, ego-boosting roles I've ever heard of. Who could honestly give a two shits about a Ryder Cup, to be honest? It's an individual's game. Hashtag OTBM. Keen, loads of people agree with you. And then the TV starts, and the fight starts over in the corner, and everybody wanders over and goes, ooh. I mean, I'm not going to lie. This year's Ryder Cup, I was like, I don't care about this. I'm not going to get into it. And then as soon as... The uh, afternoon of the first day was on. I was like, I have to watch this. Hooked. Yeah. It's one of the best sporting events for television there is. Yeah. It's without question. Like that, that doesn't necessarily disprove his point about the whole Ryder Cup captain, though. I can see why people think that, but I don't agree with it personally. I think it's actually... Uh, <laughs> it's almost got I a th- heightened impact because... I think it's the type of role that people can't be arsed trying to understand. And they're like, it's called captain and it should be the same as being captain or manager. And it's not. It's like a strategic... I've got to decide who plays where... It's chess. It's human chess. And if you're good at human chess, you win. And if you're bad at human chess, you lose. All the rest of it's nonsense. Mm. Get your matchups right, you're going to win. You can be bad at human chess and still win. How? You pick the wrong players to go up against the wrong team? You could accidentally you... stumble upon a good... Okay, well partnership. then it's a fluke. Then it's a fluke. Yeah, and I, I would say that Ryder Cup captaincy does... Who, allow who what Ryder Cup for... captains have won fluking it? Give me examples. Name names, as you uh, are I w- so happy to say. I, w- I would say that the Ryder Cup captaincy appointments have all been pretty good. Did Monty win? Think so. Damn it. Yes. Not sure. So, no, sorry, that proves my point. Fluke. Not sure. I don't think... Uh, Monty, Ryder Cup record. Did he get a home draw, basically? 
Uh, you talk amongst yourself there, Owen. Just, just talk down the lens. Con- Conor Montgomery winning as Ryder Cup captain, I would say, would be a fluke. But then, you know, maybe, maybe he's a very, very good captain and uh, it is quite different to how we view him. Like, I don't know. What, are you getting anywhere in that research? <laughs> yeah, keep going. Here. Come on, you can, you can fail for a minute I, or two. Uh, because I'm, go- I'm going to talk my way out of this argument very, very soon if you don't come up with a, an actual uh, black or white answer to this thing. I just think... Celtic Manor, of course. How could I have forgot Celtic Manor 2010? Uh, on the 4th of October 2010, Montgomery led the European team to victory 14 and a half to 13 and a half. Monty Smart. You know, he might be a, a, you know. If that was McGinley, would it have been uh, 17, more comfortable win? 17 12. It might well have been. Or whatever the maths are there. I, I, yeah, I, <laughs> Probably not 17 12. I, I don't think it's automatically you win the Ryder Cup, therefore you're a good captain. You lose the Ryder Cup, therefore you're a bad captain. It's no, not I, as I, don't as think, I don't think you can fluke a win. I don't think you can completely fluke. Unless, like back in the olden times, you might you have You can win a Ryder Cup despite a bad captain. And again, I, I really believe again, that. Yeah, I'm looking for some examples of that. Was Colin Montgomery a great captain? I think he was a good captain. The Ryder Cup is like the field of expertise about which he is like in the top percentile of human history. Of course, because he's a former professional golfer, which all Ryder Cup a, captains He was are. addicted to the Ryder Cup because it was like the bit where he actually had some success. Yeah, but like he was also... He knew more about it than anybody else at the time, every, I would say. Every single current professional golfer is in the top percentile in the world for being a, a potential Ryder Cup captain because they've played the game, they understand how it works, they understand how the mind of a golfer works. They're all good golf people, generally. And on that note, uh, the Keith Andrews Show is back today. Kevin Caban's in studio. Simon Grayson is on the line. It's live across off the ball from 12.30 p.m. on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Periscope. Offtheball.com is actually the best place to get it. It'll be uh, live and in full right there. It's the first episode of 2019. They've had a long, they've had a long Christmas. He'll be coming on saying Happy New Year to you. Feel free to tweet him and go, the new year started 10 days ago, Keith. But welcome back anyway. Off the ball is back in the radio tonight for 7 o'clock. John Giles, Stephen O'Donnell, who has retired as a footballer to join the backroom staff at Dundalk. And it looks like it's going to be a really interesting role where he'll be involved in player recruitment and helping some of the younger players um, come up too. Stephen O'Donnell, really smart guy. So it's going to be interesting to see his career in Irish football. And it's great that people like Stephen O'Donnell have an opportunity now to go, I can take a job in the League of Ireland and at some point aspire to be the manager of my country. Cork GA's five-year plan, they're going to talk with Mick Foley about that. The football show is back, obviously, from nine o'clock this evening. I'm going to leave you today with a quote from Kieran Cunningham. i sorry, a tweet from Kieran Cunningham, but it's a quote from uh, Sean O'Fallon. Sean O'Fallon, not enough Sean O'Fallon in their lives, I've got to say. So um, uh, here's the full tweet. Cork GA County Board want to bring back Corkness. The writer Sean O'Fallon had a good take on it. All Cork men have a hard streak in them. The gentlest are the most cruel. All are cynics. Smilers are the worst. There is steel and cork. There is flint and the spark of fire. See you tomorrow. Good luck.